Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Oki Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Oki Podcast. This is your host, Russell Sunny Ghoul. And on today's show, I have a very special guest. And I mean, where do I even begin? He is a former MMA fighter for Strike Force and World Combat League. He is a newly crowned black belt. He is a professor now. He is the business owner of Roofing with Thomas and Thunderkick Jiu Jitsu MMA. And he's now getting into acting. I'm going to learn so much about this guy. I mean, I've known him for a little while, but I don't really know him. So I'm glad that he came on the show and I'm glad that he, you know, made time to come out here and everything. And, um, man, I'm ready to just get, uh, get down to business, man, get to know this guy. And I hope you all get to know him too. And I hope you all love this episode. Uh, today's guest is Thomas Thunderkick Longacre. Crowd goes wild. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> What's out of this? Mate, hey, I wish I had a cool name like yours at the very end. Longacre's cool, but man, I said with a last name like that, I mean, whew, it's something fierce for sure. <laughs> That's something what everybody fierce. says. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, well, the cool thing about it is um, my, on my native side, ma- my mama's maiden name's Warrior. Oh, really? So I guess I kind of got a cool name-ish too-ish, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, we come from the Watashis and... Shawnees, Creek Uchis, and all that. So that's on that side. Um, but yeah, so nobody ever, because whenever I tell everybody, oh, I'm, my last name is Long Hinker, they go, oh, that does sound Indian. You know, I was like, well, actually, my dad's white. And so he, it's, it's not an Indian. I said, but my mom's name, that's Warrior. And they go, oh, okay, okay. So, I mean, I would, cool name, but I got one way back, way back too <laughs> with you. I said, Warrior. So I, I, def, I love that one too. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is a really cool name. Warrior. <laughs> Thomas Warrior. Yeah, so that's my girl's middle name. So, oh, really? Yeah, so when we had our little ones, we said, well, we got to find a good middle name. I said, well, we named my my, my first un, 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 behind my uh, grandmother, Lucille. Mm-hmm. So we called her Lucy. And then, but we end up, I love the warrior name. I want to kind of want to keep that that uh, last name in ours. So we was like, well, let's, let's put the middle name as warrior. So it's Lucy Warrior Longacre. Mm-hmm. And then when we had our second, we, we, we was, she was going to, he or she was going to be a Tommy Either way, you know, it's going to be a Tommy boy or a Tommy girl, whichever. And then we ended up having a girl and then eventually and her name was Tommy. And then we was like, well, we're going to have the middle name with that. I said, well, we can't have a, like my wife's like, well, what about, can we do Kathleen? I said, well, she goes, no, nah, I don't want to do Kathleen because then Lucy and Tommy, they'll get in. Why well, come I have a cool name like Lucy, you know? So, so we ended up like, well, let's go do, do both of them warriors. So that's mm-hmm. going to keep our. Uh, because my everybody's got that one grandma, mm-hmm. you know, and that was she was mine, you know, and then I want to kind of keep her heritage with us too more often, and and might as well implement the, implement that in their in their names too. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it it's it, on the native side. Yeah, it's the warrior, the warrior side, and that's one cool thing that I I use that name as fuel and fire when I fought because we took i took that to the cage with me or took me to the ring every time you know because you know cuz that's kind of what our family was and mm-hmm. and that, so i brought that with me through anything that's how i create everything as in with me any kind of challenge i fight through it i i warrior up and make it happen you know we go cuz everybody's going to go through these little ups and downs but not with not with the name with warrior behind you mm-hmm. or long acre it doesn't matter so we we going to fight to the end win or lose in life on the mat in the cage or whatever we take over yeah. So yeah. that's kind of my philosophy with it anyway. For real, we got that spirit in us, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I see it too, like, um, when I watch, like, uh, indigenous fighters, Native mm-hmm. American fighters, you know, it's just something that they just, like, they just, like, keep going. You yeah. Know? Like, no a, like a freaking zombie. Yeah. There's no quit. And doesn't matter, man. You know, like, there's always, like, that little bit of spirit in there where, you know, yeah, you might get beat, but it's not gonna be like by yeah it's yeah like, let's go we'll, we'll make it yeah. happen i'm gonna, gonna go out on my shield if, I ha- if that's the case I'm gonna go bang you know yeah, exactly <laughs> yep yep so that's i took that all the time so you know from the from the fighting part i always took that to the cage every time every mm-hmm. time so it's almost like to be be so cliche as like you, you bring your ancestors with you yeah you know that's kind of you know i bring the family name every time i, I competed you know in anything i did and mm-hmm. i was just want to make more than anything so i make everybody proud make the family proud you know because i was really the only fight really that level fighter 
So my mom, she did a, she did a lot of fighting growing up. I, I would say in the streets too, probably on the on the, on the, in the dirt <laughs> roads and all that. Mom, so she was a fighter back in the day, but she ended up doing really well in the karate circuit too. My dad boxed a little bit and did a little full, full contact, and so I was I was born in this kind of thing. So that's how my parents met was actually in martial art class. Mm -hmm. So after that, I was like, well, I guess I'm destined for this. They kind of trained me where I am today, and. Uh, fighter through and through you know and uh i enjoyed it loved it and and that's who i am today too so mm -hmm. yeah wow where did you um well, well first off before i get lost in our conversation <laughs> yeah sorry you know about uh, <laughs> uh well for the listeners you know um could you tell the listeners more a little more about yourself like where you're from you know where you grew up and what that was like and how all of that kind of just uh led to you know everything that you've done and where you are now you know and i mean we'll just like talk it up and chat it up you know i mean just, yeah just so vibe, pretty bro. much i came from the uh, i'm a country boy so we graduated from kellyville oklahoma mm -hmm. and uh my family all went to school there my grandmother did see my, my my mom my aunt my uncles so they all went to school at kellyville and i had a bunch of cousins that that man, went to the same school too so growing up um i always had family with me i i didn't have no brothers and sisters growing up but you know every time i got on the bus i'd always have three or four cousins already on the bus before me and then by the time we got to the school we'd probably pick another one or two up you know and, and in kellyville at that time you know almost half the school was probably cousins you know mm -hmm. it was crazy native american dominant where we even had a uchi speaking class at our school so you know everybody else had french and spanish you know but we had actually a native you know and 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 this side of town, you know, it's not like Tahlequah where you probably had, you know, language there. But as in here, you know, it's pretty cool to have something like that. And Kellyville was actually a, a, a curriculum that you could, uh, elective or whichever, you, you can get to pick to actually learn the, the art, learn, I guess, the language more. Mm -hmm. So we got to do that. We even incorporated that somewhat in our in our uh, secret moves when we was playing either baseball and football we would we would be because a lot of the even a lot of the white guys and everything did the ug class too mm -hmm. so we would we were able to call out certain plays certain scenarios with using using uchi language you know trick plays when nobody else knew what was going on so oh, we, wow. we figured out a way to incorporate that into it and so that was kind of fun even the coaches got onto it to where they would call out a certain number and play mm -hmm. and we knew exactly what to do you know so they got on they got on board too with my head coach you know coach lynch and and Steve Tennyson, and they was those was the ones that that started picking up on the numbers, I guess you'd say. And then mm -hmm. after that, there were certain plays that we did with those certain numbers. So that was cool because we all pretty much knew what was going on. Whenever they'd call it out, then we would know exactly what's happening, you know. So that was kind of neat to incorporate that, you know. And like I said, growing up in Kellyville, you know, it was great just because. Um, you know, all the sports we got to play because from a small school, you play everything almost, you know, we, I did, you know, we did, we, I wrestled in school, obviously did martial arts kind of off and on between sports, you know, like do a little bit of karate and all that. See, I love doing karate just because, um, I got, to, I got to hit people, you know, a little bit. I didn't like to, I didn't like too much doing the forms and katas kind of thing. I wasn't me, but for me just to show up and it's like, all right, when are we sparring? I'm when I get to hit somebody and kick <laughs> yeah. somebody kind of thing. So that was a fun thing for me growing up. And then wrestling, I did that around the same time. So I wrestled, um, probably wrestling martial arts part around the seven, eight is kind of when everything started. Cause they didn't really teach back in those times that you didn't, they didn't start them too early on anything. They didn't have anything available. Maybe T-ball, you know, maybe started early, but really it wasn't nothing they taught like four, five, six shows. Nowadays, four, five, and six shows get to do stuff. But back then, them instructors, they're like, nope, I ain't teaching and coaching nobody at that age. So they kind of started you a little later in life. And that's fine. It didn't, it didn't change anything. Um, but like I said, so we doing all sports in school, you know, such as, you know, basketball. See, Kellyville, we didn't have soccer. You know, we just had like basketball, football, and baseball, and wrestling. A little bit of track. We didn't, we wasn't crazy busy in track back then. Like I said, I graduated back in 96. So, um, that was probably before you were born, wasn't it? No, I was born in 88. Oh, well, that's kind of close. <laughs> One or two years now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, so, I, and in doing sports back then, as in martial arts and wrestling, it was able to me to, I was able to pick up a lot of things a lot quicker too, because of that kind of gave my base and foundation. And then, like I said, you know, 
the, the, the small town country life that I enjoyed, you know, just being around, you know, cause not a lot of you know, the big city people, like, let's say in my mind, big city folk was like Sopapa and, and Sand Springs and Jinx and Tulsa schools and stuff like that. See, I thought those like the big city people back in the day, you know, cause we just, you know, we were small schools. So we just did like us, everybody on this side of the tracks, I guess you'd say, you know, as in the small mentality and, and that's all we knew, you know, practicing on the dirt, football practice in the dirt with no grass and i thought everybody did that you know yeah. until you go to these big schools like turf what's turf you know and they're like wow y'all play on this all the time either for baseball or football or whatever you know um but yeah so it is, i'm glad i grew up in a small town just because it makes you appreciate things more it makes you understand what hard work and toughens you up thickens up your skin and and but also having the family atmosphere as in like everybody took care of everybody family wise like cousins you know you know, we'd have each other's back going through school, you know, and I never got in fights in school, but I always had a cousin that kind of took over. If somebody did, you know, say something bad about me, I always had a cousin that was close by. I was like, hey, <laughs> and then here they come. Is that, and because, man, I said, I got, I, I got some cousins that would fight just because you looked at them different. Just yeah. right there in the hallway, no go at it, you know. And what if I said, hey, this guy's picking on me? And he's like, which one was he at? And there, pull him in the bathroom and, and handle it right there, you know. So it's, it was good to a point because we took care of each other. Um, nowadays, it's probably a little different, obviously. But but I like those ways of actually the school. There wasn't, no, there wasn't too much any bullying going because we fixed it, you know. Because I've done a lot of bully chats, too, in small schools like that to where it was... Um, People get bullied a lot, you know, and nobody stuck up for each other. Nobody handled things without getting teachers involved or students in, or, or or their parents involved. And like, it was almost like, you know, you, you fix it at the school and the guys and the gals took care of the business back in those days. And, and uh, that was like the the cool thing about small school and small people, small, small towns, like we handle our own business and we took care of the community as in the school community part. And we didn't let trash in, you know. I wish that was a little different nowadays, but but yeah, that's one good thing about us is we 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 took care of things in in, in the small school that we were, and um, but as I don't get off, I mean, yeah, you got to stop me sometimes. I'll get on the soapbox and get the chat and chat, and we'll get oh, bro, off. Topic you're good, real you're quick. good, bro. <laughs> yeah, we'll get off topic real no, quick. No, you're good. <laughs> um, but like I said, and that and that was a cool thing is we I grew up with the guys where we played t ball together at that young age and we ended up graduating with each other. So it was probably like 10 or 12 of us that started together and we ended up graduating together. So that was cool because I didn't have brothers or sisters. So those guys that I grew up from that early age, you know, I was with them every year, every year we played same sports together every year, you know, summer ball every year. So you get really close and getting with network. And then like I said, they become almost like brothers and cousins to me. You know, we didn't either. I go over their house on some weekends, they come to mine, but there wasn't too much breaks because just because of summer ball, we always played summer ball somewhere together. And I say every one of us played on every sport too. So we was always on every sport at every type of competition you would think of. We was always together. So that's pretty neat. Until yeah. karate. I was the only one in martial arts though. So the only one. Yeah. I was about the only one. Yeah. I, was, I think there wasn't nobody else doing what I was doing in Kellyville at that time. There was, I mean, but, that was kind of a good thing because really nobody too much messed with me when I got older because I just got they started hearing to the grapevine on the word on the street I guess and and or and they's like yeah I don't mess with Thomas you know he knows this and I'm good thing I didn't get my card pulled I, I, I mean karate teaches you a little bit but it doesn't teach you too much on uh <laughs> when it's time to get down because <laughs> when you start swinging fists as that that, that takes karate right out the window real fast when you're little mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that karate don't work too much. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that all crowded people out there in the world <laughs> we're sorry we're sorry <laughs> <laughs> so when did you uh like start tran- transitioning to like mma from karate so i went from so i was doing really well in the karate circuit in in the tournaments and probably about 18 19 20 just competing more competing more i think just feeling a void of a competition because I was between high school and college, and once I got done with college, I you know I, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go back to the world, real world because college wasn't for me. So I was like, well, I had to fill a void somehow. I had to find because everybody's got to find that outlet in life, and it's got to be something, you know. Well, mine was 
going to tournaments and fighting, you know, fighting to a point where I get to get hit you and, and win trophies for it, for it. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I get to the point to where uh, my instructor was saying, cause when you're hitting people too hard, cause a lot of times I would get either disqualified or whatever. And then they was like, well, what do you think about trying full contact, you know, kickboxing? I said, I said, okay, let's do it. We can do that. So he ended up getting me a match. I my first fight was actually in Kellyville, Oklahoma, actually. So it was at the Kellyville uh, Fairgrounds. Mm-hmm. So at, at and what they did at that time is they had the boxing ring set up right in the middle of the arena on the dirt arena. Had some you know some plywood set out for people to walk on, chairs stacked out. And so my actual very first fight was at the Creek County Fairgrounds. So right there in the middle of the dirt arena. Oh wow! Kind of yeah. And, and uh, so I had a great turnout. You know, obviously the locals kind of heard about me and they, they showed up. And and after that, and I say second round knockout, I was hooked. I was like, what? This is what it feels like. You feel like a Rocky movie, you know, <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you're growing up. Even though the nerves are going crazy, you know, it's like, oh, God, oh, God, I'm scared and nervous and all that. They, then boom, when you drop them, it's like, whoa, all right, let's, yeah. And then the crowd goes nuts. And after that, I was hooked. I was hooked. And then did a couple of fights. Um, uh like in Bartlesville and Dewey and then um and then end up getting uh, an opportunity to fight for Del Apollo Cook. So he kinda got wind of me because actually at the time I was actually training another guy for one of his fight cars and then on the phone he calls or somebody I can't remember if it I think it might have been Jamie the, the his first lady in the office and she called me or it might have been him. I can't remember. It might have been him actually he called and goes, hey, I heard. And I said, what's your name again? I said, Longacre. I said, Thomas, said, you're 19, t- uh, Nancy, or you're tiny. And you know, she called, they called my mom tiny back then. Mm-hmm. You're tiny and Leon's boy, ain't you? And I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, I heard you can fight. I said, yeah, well, I can, I can, I can do a little bit. Yeah. He goes, what about if I get you on the fight card too? And I said, okay. So while I was training, my friend of mine, Jack, we ended up training together at the same time, you know, and I didn't really know what, you know, too much about, you know, um, coaching, and fight at exactly the same time, you know, like, okay, let's just keep doing what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that right there was a big, in my mind, because I heard about his shows and I was like, and I remember going to some of them. So I just talked to my wife just about this a few months ago, or probably about a month ago. I was like, hey, um, yeah, we're all stars. I remember going to his shows, sneaking in at the end, at the tour at the end where they wouldn't take an admission. We'd watch like the second half of the fight show. And I remember thinking, man, I can do this. And I wasn't fighting that, you know, at that before. So that was, so that was prior before I even totally started kind of thing. I remember getting in there to where I was like, man, I think I can probably do this one day. You know, well, that day came, you know, I had the opportunity and I started, I had a couple, couple fights underneath me. And then he t- asked about me. I was like, okay, let's go. And then I ended up fighting my big first big show for him. So in his mind, he knew I was a Native American guy. The kickboxer guy so he's like thinking about bigger picture all right he, he's gonna be my poster boy for these indian casinos coming up and all that and and uh, so even it was doing that on the live television whenever they aired that first fight you know i in the commentary he's like yeah he's he's these this from that for the you know a casino he's gonna be bigger in the casinos and this and that and i ended up fighting this big old gigantic monster dude and and but i was my confidence was already there because my talent i was there my talent was able to outshine without a lot of training. I was like, oh, I'm going to get this guy. I got him. He can't touch me kind of thing. Mm-hmm. First round go, like I said, this guy was probably another foot taller than me, you know, and and uh, we was working. I was sticking and moving, sticking and moving. First round, and you hear like the 10-second count when they hit the side of the ring, and and uh, I'm working, working, him, and then bam, out of nowhere, he catches me with the hook, drops me, puts me to sleep. So on live television, I get knocked out. So it was one of those knockouts to where eyes are wide open, my arms are stuck straight in the air, stiff as a board, and then you kind of see my arms kind of go down, go down, go down. But I mean, so that was crazy. Well, like I said, I don't remember that punch. I don't remember anything happened. I remember mm-hmm. Jack in the back in the, in the locker room taking my gloves off, and that's when I wake up. I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? I said, yeah, why are you taking my gloves off? So I don't even remember fighting. Ooh. I don't remember going warming up. Cause I thought I haven't went yet. I said, I haven't went yet. And he goes, no, the fight's over. So that's, but that's crazy. Cause I'm looking back and watching the film mm-hmm. behind the scenes. I mean, I set up, they talk to me, I stand up, I'll get out of the ring. 
they kind of somewhat helped me, you know, kind of not put my arm on the shoulder and kind of, we would walk out together. We walk all the way back out of the ring, back to the locker room. And then, then that's when I wake up. So that's crazy <laughs> how like that. So that wow. happened. And that right there was motivation to like, after everything finalized, you know, because then you got to tell everybody in the world that wasn't there. What we had, a, I had a huge crowd because, Hey, it's my big Tulsa fight. It's going to be on TV. Del Apollo Cook's promoting it. So I ended up calling everybody and cousins and family and friends. And they all showed up. And you heard a pin drop in that place when that happened. Because everybody thought I was going to work the guy. Mm -hmm. And it's just being overconfident. And then thinking that your 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 talent only can put you through. But after that, I learned, nope, I got to work. I got to actually train. I got to actually get, you know, sharpen, the, sharpen tools, learn more tools, be coachable. And then so that... And I was wanting to train right after that. Like after our that after that we went out. I had to, I think back then we went to uh, Magoo's and had and played pool. I was just so mad and upset, you know. And uh, really just kind of hang out, just playing pool with all my cousins and friends and all the people I worked with. And but in my mind, you're 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 internally, I guess saying, man, I gotta get to the gym. I gotta get to the gym. I get I gotta get better. I don't want this to happen again. This I mean I do not. This was this is a terrible feeling. Cause then you got everybody calling you, you know, or back in then they was paging you, you know, and I was like, Hey, how'd the fight go? How'd the fight go? And I was like, and you had to tell it over and over and over. And I, like, I got knocked out and everybody was like, what, what? No way, no way. So that right there motivated me to be a better fighter because, because that was a terrible feeling. Just like anything, you know, if you lose something, you don't want that to happen again, mm -hmm. but you learn from that. You learn from that too. So I'm glad I didn't go like 30 and 0 undefeated because you would never get to experience what a, what a loss was like. Mm -hmm. But the thing is I got, I got to experience what a loss was like, but I got also got to experience what, a, what being knocked out was actually like. See, a lot of these cats don't know what a lot being knocked out is like, you know, they already have that. They have, they always have that, that lingering fear in the fight world. It's like, man, I don't want to get knocked out. I don't know what that's, I don't know what that's going to be like, you know? Mm -hmm. So back then I was glad that it happened early in my career because I got to experience it. It's almost like, well, it didn't hurt. I just wake up and you don't know where, what happened, you know, kind of thing. But you get to watch the film a million times after that and see exactly what you did wrong mm -hmm. and learn from it. And even today it's, it's, we do things as in, you know, you win and you learn and that's it. It's no winning and losing. We're winning and learning because you're learning to be better, you know, and, and, and whatever, in jiu-jitsu and fighting in life or whichever, because we're all going to win in life. We're always going to, and we're going to have failures in life, but we got to make sure we learn from those and get better from it. That's how you, that's how, you, I mean, that's how you do it in life. That's, that's what you got to do. You yeah. Know, you got to learn from everything. So you don't make those same mistakes again and do whatever it takes to train or gain knowledge or, you know, listen to podcasts, you know, or anything like that. That's going to develop that skill to be sharper, be wiser, you know, and, but at the same time, you have to go, sometimes you have to seek it or you got to surround yourself with people that's on this, on, on that path, you know, because that's one thing there. Guys are tough on asking for help. You know, they, they don't like asking for help at all, you yeah. know, but, but if you, if, but once you get older to my age and your age too, it's like, you should understand that you got to reach out sometimes, man. I need some help with this. I need some help with that. You know, either with business life issues or something because you can't i've learned and that you have you can't hold everything in you can't it's not it's, we're not meant to be alone we're not we're meant to have you know besides having a, a great companion but at the same time we're we want to have friends we can lean on for encouragement motivation input or and also at the same time correcting correcting you because you need those guys in your life too it's like hey you better start acting right kind of thing. You need that accountability too. Yeah. Got off topic again, but my bad. That's just no, how I go sometimes. No, you're good, man. Uh, yeah. You need that community, man. Like, mm. you know, like you're saying, and it's hard to find, you know, a community like that, that will do those things for yeah. you, you know, because sometimes, man, you just let people in your lives and they'll tell you what you want to hear Yeah, and you won't ever like grow into what, you're probably supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know? So you're kind of just stuck in like, Oh, you know, I'm still doing good. Yeah. Oh, you know, like I do drink all the, all the time, but they're not saying anything. So, right. you know, like it takes like a true friend, brother, whatever, you know, yeah. to say, yo, you know, like you're scaring us or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I think you need to stop, yeah. you know, and then just take time on like 
I mean, that's just an example, you know, but yeah, yeah. just take time on like finding out like why they're like that, mm-hmm. you know, and then help, you know, not like fucking bash or anything, you know, right. but like just like fucking help and be as supportive as, you, as supportive as you can, you know, with that issue. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, uh, and yeah, like you're saying, man, it's like, uh, I'm learning that too. Like I'm learning to ask questions. I'm learning to, you know, not be afraid of failure. Yeah. You know, because when I was younger, man, like, God, I was so afraid to ask anything because I didn't want to sound stupid. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want people to look at me and think of like, why is he asking that? Yeah. I know it, yeah. but why, why doesn't he know it? You know, mm-hmm. I always had like these fucking stupid thoughts like that. Yep. And then I was always afraid to like try something and fail at it mm-hmm. because I was like, well, fuck. I failed at that. So I guess I'm just going to fail at everything, you know? So, but I mean, like, you know, I got into uh, jujitsu too. And when I actually like, like you, man, like, you know, I, I was talking about this with, uh, Wes Cunningham. Do you know who that is? Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him the other day and, uh, cause he was on and we were talking about like jujitsu and stuff. And I was saying like, like, yeah, man, like, you know, when I signed up for jujitsu, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what it was. You know, I watched UFC and to me, it just looked like boxing with some wrestling, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, and I didn't really care to educate myself. And, you know, you know, my brother, Scott Lowe. Mm -hmm. So I knew he did MMA, but I, dude, I had no idea like what it was. And so I owed like this outstanding bill to college. So I couldn't go back. And then Mm -hmm. I just started Googling like MMA gyms because I felt like I needed to do something, Mm -hmm. you know, not just sit around and work. And so I found this one gym, I went to it and I was just like really like kind of ignorant. I was ignorant at the time. I'm not going to say kind of, but I was ignorant because I, I felt like I was still relatively strong and athletic. So I thought like, oh, I'm just bigger than everyone. So I'm just going to fucking throw them down and you know, like do whatever I want. Right. To so, I mean, and then when you go like when you go to your actual like jujitsu class or you go to like a striking class. And those dudes in there, man, like, they don't fucking play, mm-hmm. you know? Like, they go in, like, they're there every day, whether they're paying money to kick each other's ass. And, I mean, they're just training to, like, they're training to, like, to be murderers. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> yeah. the best way at I legal, can put it. At a legal level. At a legal level, like, don't fuck with nobody that does, like, you. jiu-jitsu, MMA, <laughs> wrestling, don't fuck with nobody. <laughs> and uh, so I went, and I was, like, real ignorant about it. And, man, that's one dude just, like, tore me up, man. Uh, took me down i I fucking fell down and just held me down just did whatever he wanted to me and i was like using like my strength yeah trying to push him off and i i didn't really know what shrimping out was you know to use your hips and use everything like technique wise you know i was using like strength i was trying to push him off like bench press him off and got gassed and oh my god it just felt like i was drowning and so like it was like a really humbling experience mm. to be handled like that. Right, when yeah. somebody, when you, you know, like I'm a big dude, but you know, like. Yeah, you think you're, you're, you're going to do fine. Yeah. And I think Until. like, and I'm like, yeah, I'll do all right. You know, and then, it, but it's like really humbling because bro, like you just, they could just do whatever they want to you. And then like, I remember like being sad after that. I was like, yeah, you bro, up. this ain't for me. Like, uh, I'm not, I don't want to come back because I felt like really embarrassed, mm. you know, because. I didn't say anything when I was in there, like cocky or anything. I just went and did it. Right. And then, but everybody was like really cool. Everybody was saying like, you know, keep coming back, L- you know, learn about yourself. You know, le- you could learn so much about yourself doing jujitsu and, or MMA and all that. Mm-hmm. So I, I did, I kept going back and I kept learning more and more about myself. And yeah, the more I like, the more I went, the more I like wasn't afraid to tap out. You know, because I was always a big thing with me, like, oh, I'm not going to tap. Yeah. Not going to yeah. tap. No, go, choke me out. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. so, this is real stupid like that. But, but I mean, like, that was that, you know, that little community of, like, just being, like, fucking, like, just being, like, really supportive, like you're saying and everything. So, yeah. And, I mean, that's really cool that, you know, you bring that up and you've built that here, you know. Right. And, uh, man, I never got to go to your gym. I always planned on going, but I was always like working. Like I got stuck on graveyards. So I'd always fucking sleep during the day. And, yeah. 
And then, like, we had, like, money problems, and then we moved here. So we were even further away from your first location, you know, and, and now you've moved to location? Yeah, so we moved here recently. We just moved to Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Yeah. So we just moved. We were in Tulsa. We were first. We was in Jinx in Oklahoma. So we Jinx first. We moved back from Texas. Jinx. Then we went from there to Promenade Mall. We was yeah, there for about, Promenade Mall. Yeah, we was there for about four or five years, I think. And then here recently, just moved this this year. I think January fourth was our first class in Sepulpa. Moved the whole operation there, and it made sense. I mean, at the time, last November, a lot of people don't know. Last November, me and the wife and Thanksgiving, we kind of had an. We come to like, man, I think I'm done with this because of, besides COVID, um, it was this extra because I was full time roofing in the daytime and 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 the gym was never a money maker ever for me. It's just a passion. I love to I love to help people train, mm-hmm. get ready for fires, but also just giving a cool place for people to just be a part of. Mm-hmm. And in this factor of life, I guess you'd say, you know, wasn't wasn't like a softball league. It was like. You get to come to a cool thing called fight class and jiu-jitsu and all that fun stuff. So it, it came a, a positive place for people. Again, like I was talking about earlier about outlets. You know, these are, I think guys need this a lot. And some and females do too. They need something to kind of define themselves, to to be pushed and challenged, to be tested. Because that's, all it does is equip them better for life too, I think. You know, as in like, because once you once you're able to endure overcome situations on the ground against getting punched on or whatever like that it it it, it strengthens you in, internally more because you know what you've been through you've dealt with and 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 overcome you know mm-hmm. and then that's how we teach the same way is like that's what i love about the jiu-jitsu part is because that fighting was is i think jiu-jitsu was harder than fighting me for my, if, if coming from a striking standpoint Mm-hmm. because striking I can fight and swing my way out of things and jiu-jitsu if I, you can't swing and punch no more now just because the rules are changed but it, it, you discipline yourself alright we're going to play by those rules but man just like you were saying that, that humbling feeling whenever I know I could knock you out and put you to sleep I can't do anything to you right now because of your jiu-jitsu skill mm-hmm. you know it's like you, you I thought and just same way as you thinking, it's like, oh, I can handle myself. I'm all right. And then you find somebody that's actually trained in this. And it's like, yep, I'm like a fish out of water. I thought I thought my old school wrestling could handle me, but with somebody that's trained in that art of jujitsu, man, it it really it it makes you want to be better. Just like anything with like in the fight world, but the same thing in jujitsu. It's like, man, I don't, I don't want I don't want to be this one dimensional person because back in when I first started fighting, everybody was like, oh, he's just a stand up guy. He's just a stand up guy only. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, come t- try to take me down and see if I and see if you can take me down. Mm-hmm. But nobody, because nobody knew I wrestled all through school. I wrestled all through elementary, junior high, and high school, and so I had that base already. And then once I got it, got to a point of doing MMA. Um, I, well, I first opened a gym in Tyler, Texas. So I moved there first. So I helped get a couple of gyms going in Tyler because East Texas, there was a gym in Longview, Texas. And after that, it was Dallas. So so Tyler was kind of right between Longview, Texas, or really between Shreveport, Louisiana, and Dallas. And there was Tyler, Texas. And the closest thing MMA-wise was either like Lions Den in Dallas, you know, with Guy Metzger, or Longview MMA, you know, or something like that. And, and and that was it. So there wasn't nothing Tyler, Texas, jujitsu, MMA, nothing. So when I moved there, there was like a there was a guy teaching out of a church because I was still I was heavy heavily in in World Combat League when I moved to Tyler, Texas. So I had, I still had fights going. We were still in the middle of the season and all that. So I needed to find somewhere to train. So I was I was calling local boxing gyms just using their heavy bag, but also doing my running and sprinting around town. You know, because at the time I lived downtown at a little loft place, but I was run, running the streets of downtown Tyler, running around, but using heavy bags and like, some, and it was hard to find sparring because nobody either did, everybody did boxing or they did karate or, or something like that. And well, mm-hmm. I couldn't really get good rounds in because I need, so I just kind of worked a heavy bag. And then, so I ended up getting a gym, help get a gym going there called Lone Star MMA. And then after I got them to a point, you know, me and the owner had, didn't didn't work out too well because he was a lot older guy than me. They didn't have any kind of martial art background, but he paid for 
because he was like a U. I think he was like a a Texas Marshal or whatever. And I'm not I'm not dissing Texas Marshals, but I say he was a guy that said he was uh you know a Gracie somebody. But cause he got just cause a guy took pictures with the Royce Gracie doesn't mean you you are a Gracie level kind of guy, you mm-hmm. know. But he was one of those guys that name dropped. Oh, I know Royce Gracie. Oh, did this and that. Which there's people here in town that do that too because they got pictures with him. They think they train with him all the time on a regular basis. I think you've probably seen Royce Gracie as much as I have. You can't say you trained with him. I've done some seminars with him too. Mm-hmm. That's, that's I don't ever gonna name drop him like that because how about you know so you got people like that 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 like because they act like they train with somebody but they like met him two or three times they think that I'm trained under certain people mm-hmm. but you'll get that anyway this guy was like that and um, and I seen this type of training and he would have like 30 40 people in East Texas in his church training as you know in these little fold out mats at the at and uh, I was noticing that he didn't really teach anything very technical at all. Then he started noticing that I, st- I knew a little bit of something. So he was like, hey, what do you think about us doing a gym together? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we get a gym together. He got a cage and all that. And then at the time, his wife was taking all the incoming phone calls because I had it on a pay scale to where I, I get a percentage of everything, everybody I teach. And obviously, he gets to, te- he gets to keep everything because it was his place. Mm-hmm. you know. But like I said, this is a guy that, that didn't know any, kind of, any type of really MMA training or fight training at all that had no business teaching it and his classes were you know 30 people in it and i had like three of mine and that was like hmm i said and i said oh that makes sense yeah because i don't you're only gonna pay me on a couple feet a couple guys you don't want if i have 30 people in my class i get a piece of everybody's of everybody's fees and tuition so that's where we butt heads because his wife directed people to what class to take oh you need actually you probably need to go take you know, my husband's class kind of thing like that. I was like, I understand your game. So at that time, you know, LA boxing came to town. So that was back when LA boxing started getting a big franchise back in in those days. And they brought one to Tyler, Texas. And at that time, um, they didn't have anybody to teach type of classes. And and so I had a little four or five guys training with me uh, at that Lone Star gym. So we ended up bouncing, going to this gym to help them. They hired us as the head instructors, teaching all their, you know, their cardio kickboxing classes all along with the MMA program, the kickboxing program. And then after a while, you know, like the same thing, this kid that that, that uh, had this place was a silver spoon kid and was born into money and he thought he knew anything, something about the fight game, which he did. And there again, if, you, if there's people in place in business that it shouldn't be doing business. And that's just with any, a lot of people, you, I, you start learning that you shouldn't be in this business, you know, because you have no idea what you're doing. So learning from that, you know, I was like, I'm making everybody else money. I'm going to get my own gym. So that's how I started my own thing at Thunderkick. And Tyler started, mm-hmm. moved to Jinx, Promenade. Now, Sepulpa, it worked out great because I'm from Creek County, Sepulpa area. My other head instructor graduated from Sepulpa. Is, he lives in Sepulpa, too. And also my other instructor is uh, a Sepulpa firefighter. So it made sense. It made sense. And plus, we had a great following already from the many years of people following me from fighting, but also hearing about my classes, but never could come to my classes because it was too far away from Tulsa. So now that I got the opportunity now where people in that area, you know, can come to class. And like, we've had an incredible amount of support. Also, uh, our attendance is out, is through the roof right now. And we're trying to grow the kid program. You know, we do a kid program from seven to 12, a jiu-jitsu program but the cool thing with my jiu-jitsu program with the kids is i teach them striking too mm-hmm. so it's just, they're learning jiu-jitsu but also i'm teaching them how to throw punches kicks knees elbows and stuff because i want them to learn that but also the main thing because after i've done all the these these different type of martial arts and combat i think jiu-jitsu is probably about the best thing for kids because it it, it, te- it is kind of it's like that wrestler somewhat wrestler mentality with jujitsu, but also I get to teach them how to punch and kick and throw down if they have to. Mm-hmm. But because I think uh, jujitsu and wrestling, it, it creates a uh, a different mentality, strength in this in, in them. From wrestling, I grew up as like you know, like everybody knows if you get a hundred percent pure wrestler, them are bad dudes. You yeah, know? they're yeah. Just strong and they're just oh, they're just in your face. Jiu-Jitsu is, uh, is almost a, somewhat the same, but more a, little, more a softer way of grinding and submitting you with ease. Where you know it's 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 a little bit different aspect of it, 
but it's still a powerful art once somebody gets really good at it. Mm-hmm. How to control somebody without them hurting you. And that's one good thing about kid program is learn understanding how to, you know, control somebody from a dominant position without having to punch the person. You know, and that's pretty awesome. So that's kind of what you know, my my oldest is in it, you know, and you know, I love it that she's in it because she's gonna be able to do jujitsu and take care of herself and do it with a smile if somebody does mess with her. You mm-hmm. know, she's gonna be able to take them down and top mount them and then hold them down and just smile and laugh because they can't get up. You know, mm-hmm. and that's what the confidence they get from from that early age, and that confidence just takes stays with them growing up in school and high school and also i mean there's no telling if i start you know if you and me started jiu-jitsu back as you know my girl i mean say let's say let's say we started at seven years old in jiu-jitsu and you continued it for 20 30 years i mean the mentality you get from it by being a humble um the strength uh your mental game strength grows out i mean your physical i mean the confidence you walk to a anywhere in life you feel almost like the man or the woman mm-hmm. it doesn't matter but the confidence is be out uh, outstanding and you need to carry that confidence to your workplace you know as in like you're, you're confident of what you can do i'm not saying you, you know but i think that instills a big quality and characteristic of just being physically but also mentally strong to be able to take on anything and i think jiu-jitsu helps out in that world of it i think it just just the growing mentality of 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 uh, just being st- your st- st- strengthening yourself, you know, I think that's a great thing about jujitsu, and I'm glad that my little ones are doing it too. Yeah, Man, geez, that's what I want my kids to do jujitsu, mm-hmm. you know, when we have them, yeah, <laughs> yeah. one day, yeah, one, one day. day, you know, yeah. I, I'd like for them to, you know, get into jujitsu and just. Because it's great self defense. Yeah. You know, right. and, and like you said, man, it's the best way to control somebody without actually like punching them, mm-hmm. you know, having to like fucking hurt them and shit. Right. So, yep. Yep. So I, I definitely agree, man. And so after doing everything, you know, boxing, kickboxing, MMA, Jiu Jitsu, I think Jiu Jitsu is about the best thing, about the best thing for anybody to do. All ages, too. You know, start start early and it's never too late. Mm-hmm. You know, you just go to, if it's late late in life, you just start in a slow pace. Easy pace, slow pace, and, and uh, kind of go from there. But, um, but yeah, like I, said, I got bad knees now. And, and so I just modified my Jiu Jitsu to my body where you can still apply things and do things. But it just changes up your game, but you're still able to stay in the game i guess you'd say mm-hmm. um so there's there's always a, a an answer for something that but your body does limit you sometimes but you figure it out with your i guess your 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 uh your shortcoming let's say like there's only certain things i can do i can't fold in half like these little gumby guys can <laughs> yeah. yeah i can't do that but i can still figure out a way to get get to your neck you know mm-hmm. so that's the cool thing about it though with jiu-jitsu Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you still compete in the tournaments? Yeah, I, I I do when I can. When I'm not, you know, I say if I don't jam a thumb or tweak a, something or tweak that or hurt that, you know, because I because even though I don't I do jiu-jitsu but I still get in there and train with the guys sparring. So I do that every you know occasionally, you know, and I grapple these young guys all the time. It keeps my edge, but a lot of times at these tournaments, like say jiu-jitsu now, so I can't fight no more. So but the jiu-jitsu tournaments, like I have so many. I have, I say so many, but you know, if I got five or six people going, I got I need to be there and help coach them. You mm-hmm. know, I've done my thing. I've yeah. done, I've, I've done my competitions. Um, but I, I'm going to try to do one probably this year. Uh, cause I want to kind of just kind of see where I'm at and also see this, let the students watch me in action let them kind of see how I, I compete too, because you got to lead by example also. Um, and with Jiu Jitsu, I can't, I can still can, I can't fight, you know, fight no more. But with jiu-jitsu, I can still get down with that, mm-hmm. and uh, they, I can kind of there you go, kind of show show them that hey, just you know, do what you train, stick to the curriculum, stay chill and calm, and and then just allow the jiu-jitsu to work itself, you mm-hmm. know. Because the cool thing about it also is that I get to go my age bracket and <laughs> and everything <laughs> else. I'm like the old gray-haired people. <laughs> I'm a, I'll slap a gray, gray, gray-haired person. Around. <laughs> is that um? Oh, what's it called? Uh, I like the silver division. No, uh, <laughs> dang it, senior. 
No. Maybe it's called Masters. Is it Masters? It might, it might, they might call it Masters like the old person division, but I think they might call it, it might have a senior division. Where you're like over like 30? 80. Yeah, it's like an eight, it over, and, I think there's over 30, there might be an over 40. I can't remember the name but of it. But I'm in that over 40 category, so I'm good. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's hard to find over 40 people. It, a lot of times I, I got to go in the 20s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that ain't fun. God. Yeah. Gosh dang it. <laughs> Young pups. That ain't fair. You're a warrior, though. That's right. I'm going to headbutt you because <laughs> I, I get there. I could use the old man tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I seen you uh, just about a couple months ago. You got your black belt, huh? Yeah. Just recently got my black belt. Every time I, you know, I, I was, I'm never in my mind was ready because I'm, I'm old school, traditional, so I, I like to earn my belts kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, but he knows me as an instructor and as a person that how I lead by example. But at the same time, he knows I've been dealing with injuries and tweaks and knees and this and that for, you know, it's almost like I get I get going for about six months and something happens and I'm off six months. I guess so. And so I didn't like not being able to because I wanted to be at that time. I wanted to be a brown belt that everybody's like. He's legit. He needs to get a black belt. I want him. He, he he's staying back in too long. You know. I wanted to be that as in like people respect where I can hang with black belts. I might not tap you, but I can hang with you mm-hmm. because that's kind of what I wanted to get to. Well, and then I guess in his mind, he's like, "Hey, now you ready? Because you you're one of my guys that leads the curriculum by example that teaches my stuff correct. You're a great uh, role model for your instructors and your students and your community. So he looks at other characteristics too." But mm-hmm. at the same time, he does know I can still get down on the ground and make and make that happen. Um, and I guess in his mind, he thought I was ready, you know. So it it you never feel like you're ready when you do get it. It's like, no, nah, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And then boom, out of nowhere, you are, you know. But then it makes you it takes it to another level. So now you have to pretty much def- they he calls it defend your rank. Mm-hmm. You, you got to be able to defend your rank, you know. As in, like if you go against a black belt, you got to be able to handle him, you know. You know brown belts, purple belts, whichever. So, because there's a lot of people out there that get belts that can't hold, that, that yeah. can't defend their belt, you know. Mm-hmm. And those like, oh, I can't roll today, or how come this person never rolls, never grapples? You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people out there. I was like, I never see this person grapple, or I never see that person compete, mm-hmm. you know, because they're scared to get to, to lose. They're scared of failure. They're scared to. To get punked out in front of everybody, you know, because mm. it's like, oh, maybe you ain't all that. Well, I mean, that's beside the point. You need you need to test yourself. You need to challenge yourself. You need to lead by example, and you and, and you need to show people that you can lose. That's okay, mm-hmm. because losing whenever whenever you do, besides learning, but also is like, oh, it wasn't a big deal to him. So that's not, uh, so don't it helps your younger and uh lower ranks too like see it's not no big deal to, to lose mm-hmm. most of us 99 percent of us got daytime jobs so i'm not gonna go balls to the wall and get at it and try to get hurt either you yeah. know i said if you get something somewhat somewhat close with me i'm tapping i i i, I gotta be able to you know work tomorrow so i'm not a i'm not a i'm not a die hard kind of guy when it comes to jiu-jitsu um but like i said i'll tap in a heartbeat yeah. I, I, ain't, I ain't no big deal to me. If you catch me, you catch me. That's all. That's no thing at all. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, with ranking, go back to it as in like I, every person's got to be able to be able to defend their belt, mm-hmm. you know. And you need to go out there and grapple. And I don't, I don't care, you know, if if, if whatever. I mean, I, I want all belts to be able to defend. Uh, just me personally, but there's I, I I get aggravated because I was like man there ain't no brown belt or there ain't no purple or there ain't no black belt you know I was like but I said I I, I in my mind I want to be able to defend my rank and that makes that makes me step up my game now because he put me promoted me to black I was like well I got to get at it more now so I'm telling my guys you know I got I got two brown belts underneath me that's you know you know, one's about 10 years younger than me. And other one's probably about six or seven years younger than me. One of them, and they're, you know, one of them just got recently got hired on with the, the light horseman, Daryl Wilson. Oh, so nice. He, 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 he got hired with them. And then also the other one's a firefighter and he's just like a, a brute beast, you know, but there was one of the top fighters in the Oklahoma. And then now he's, career change into he always wanted to do something military or police force or something so he finally got his career moved to light horseman so he's doing his tasering and pepper spraying these last few weeks and getting all and showing me cool videos and mm-hmm. so now he's he's pursuing a different career but he's still one of my instructors and so those two guys there keep me sharp those two guys make me better because obviously 
age bracket change, but also I've taught them and they're, and they're, and they're just getting better and better, you know, and, and they're the ones that keep me sharp. Those two guys right there, you mm-hmm. know, cause I see them all. And plus the, you know, they row safe because it's hard to find another thing with jujitsu. It's hard to find people to row safe with. You can still row and get a good workout and get tested, get challenged. But some of these guys, they're trying to they're trying to seek to tap and try to tap to tap people too hard and you know as a man so that's why that's why it's tough to grow with grow with other people other high level belts because um a lot of times they try to prove something it's yeah like, i don't need to prove nothing if you want to prove we can go out in that parking lot if you want to prove something you know but mm-hmm. if we're just grappling we're rolling like two gentlemen then this is have a good time and just yeah. chill out and work get a workout in you know yeah there's a and i'm not gonna probably not gonna tap you I'm I said, I'm just gonna grapple and roll because I mean because once you get used to grappling and rolling you like it because you're constantly sweating you're working so you're you're improving your conditioning your cardio your stamina but also staying sharp applying the art at the same time and not being a d bag with the, with your partner so that's one good thing I like it with my guys is and then some people I get to roll with too I'm mean, not I'm not saying they're saying saying everybody is like that but there is so bunch of them out there yeah. that gotta try to prove something. You know, and and I'm not that guy, and I don't, and I ain't gonna roll with those type of guys. You know, and mm-hmm. you know if that's the case, then it's, uh, just put some gloves on if you want to do that. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's like uh, I know what you're talking about. It's like yeah. you start rolling, and you know, it's just like like I'm just here to like learn or you know roll and just have like a fucking good time, and yeah. then. Then you, then this dude's like, just like going like hard as fuck, yeah. and you're like, oh great, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, I'm fixing a bite to this guy's so, ear. <laughs> so then it makes you go hard, and then you just get fucking tired, and it's like this, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, dang it. Dang Can you it. go sit out or something? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Can you go watch the clock and make sure it's the right time or something, man? <laughs> fuck. Right. Oh. <laughs> Get a water break or yeah, something. Yeah, can you like go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Let us new all partner. have fun. <laughs> I want a new partner. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, I remember my like first tournament, dude. I was like fucking scared. I was scared. I was so fucking scared. Yeah. But like, uh, damn man, like I cut like uh, I think I cut like fifteen pounds because I was going for two fifteen. Mm-hmm. And then like uh, the tournament I was the first tournament I was in. I cut weight and I made it, I got down to 213 and then, uh, so man, like we got there and then we're like, wait, like we're all lined up and they're like, okay, like, uh, so, uh, guys, the heavyweights, they only have three people. Do you guys mind letting them in your bracket? These guys are huge. Like, yeah, you can't say no. <laughs> crap. Okay. Yeah, I know. Like everybody looked at each other. We're like. I guess. And they walked up and they're like fucking huge. And I was like, man, why did I cut weight? <laughs> I should have just stayed in their bracket. Yeah, I've been in a solder for three hours today and yesterday. I haven't ate nothing since Monday. Now these guys, these guys have been eating buffets every day. For real, yeah. And they're, they're just... showing up, you know, freaking Goliaths and freaking jacked up. Oh, I could imagine. Dude, they just used us up. I got I got third in that one. I was very surprised, but I had to go against uh, the guy that won he first. He won first place, and dude smoked me. The guy that won second, like we were just I don't know what his deal was. He just kept grabbing on my gi and just holding on to you. Yeah, just holding on to me. So it was like really weird, and it was my first tournament. So I was like, uh, I guess let I'll, go. <laughs> yeah, let go. I guess I'll just pull you in my guard, and then when I did that, dude, he just laid on me, and he was yeah. heavy, and I was like, oh god. It yeah, sucks. you get some of got. Yeah, I've seen the big guys go, and uh, sometimes you, whoever gets on top wins because that that that, guy, that guy's not gonna get off, yeah. and you can't get him off. Nope. So it's game over. Yeah, he was <laughs> heavy, and I was like, oh god. So time oh. ran out, and then he won by points because mm. he uh, he got past my guard, and he was just on top of me at a mount. Yeah, and he was just holding me down. And I was like, oh god, like, and I was super tired. <laughs> uh. And then like after that, I signed up for nogi. So I got done with gi and then I had to get no gi and I was spent like, I don't even place. And <laughs> so I was oh, like, whatever. <laughs> like, oh my this is the last time I do that. Oh <laughs> like sign God. up for two divisions. <laughs> yeah. Also, so check this out. So I got, I got some, I got some mad props for a cousin of mine. He just started training with us probably in January, but he came from Sepulpa. He was a wrestler, a good wrestler, Keelan Bearpaw. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he just started doing jiu-jitsu with us in January and he's like, hey, there's a tournament coming up. I told we told him about it. He goes, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I said, is he sure? Because some of these guys, 
because when you go into white now they changed it to where in, in AGF uh, American Grappling Federation they changed it to where white belts is all white belts so back then it was like inter- novice intermediate oh, and all okay. that and even even in the white belts just like zero to six months six months to two years or something like that Mm -hmm. so now white belt level is all white belt level so because some white belts are white belts for two to three years sometimes of consistently training or just wanting to rack up points or just sandbagging sandbag yeah correct and i told keelan i said man some of these guys you know i've been doing it for a while and you've only been doing jujitsu for about you know maybe six eight weeks you know but it's not i was gonna try i think i can do okay so i said okay well cool because he's got that you know that native in him he's like yeah i think i do it because he wrestles so he i think he's 21 i think so he's kind of been out of the competition off a of competition mode for a little, couple of years from high school mm-hmm. um but dude this dude here so he did he did so they, they used to back probably whenever you competed in me they had an absolute but that absolute was like all weight classes in one kind of thing well now they got a thing called the challenger series so he did he did a, he did his no gi division uh, and then also no gi challenger, and then he did gi his division, and did no, and then gi challenger. So he did four divisions, Whoa. four divisions. So he and his first match was at eight thirty that morning. So and it was in Oklahoma City just last weekend. Yeah, first match started eight thirty, and after that it was he was he was the last match of the night. So it was like he started the show and ended the show kind of thing. So so this guy had nine matches Jeez. in one day. He had he had. He, he got three gold and one silver. Oh, man. That's so he, awesome. He, he medaled in every one of them. Wow. Then, I mean, it's crazy. It, it's, too, it's so crazy because he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a soft, gentle person. Mm-hmm. And then he goes in there and just dominates. Dominates. You know, besides having a good wrestler background and base, yes. Mm-hmm. But the great thing about it is, like, the things that I taught him in these few weeks, he applied it in, in this in his competition. Mm-hmm. He was coachable. Like, I'm sitting right there coaching him, and he's doing – you know, he's doing everything I'm telling him, mm-hmm. you know, and that was so awesome to see. His lady competed. She got second or third, I think. So they, they're, they're going to Sepulpa, the Sepulpa gym with us and all that. And and it was just pretty awesome to see um, him compete, but also him him apply the things that he learned in class. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't doing like some homemade stuff. All right, so the only homemade thing he did, he did a heel hook, and you can't do heel hooks in white belt level. Yeah. And he was in a, like I said, he, uh, he probably seen it on TV or something like that, you know, and it's like, that's the reason why you don't do stuff you see on YouTube so much, because you get DQ for it. Well, anyway, mm-hmm. he got to, like, he was, like, inside the guy's guard, and the guy had an open guard, had his foot on his hip, and I think he, and Keelan was just postured up on his knees. Well, that guy had his heel right here, so he kind of go for a heel hook right then. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't really know how to apply the heel hook, but he just, like, he seen it, like, oh, I'm going to get underneath the heel and start tweaking on it. So he went. He just reached back and got underneath the heel, and they they get dink stop. There, right, that's it. DQ'd, and this is the time he was. He was. I think that was tied up pretty much, and he's probably going to win because he because it's hard to get him on the back on his back. He's always staying top, staying top, staying top, mm-hmm. and letting his base and his wrestling take over. So I guarantee you, if he didn't do that heel hook, he probably would have had four gold. At, and like I said, two of those were like weight classes one seventy and all the way to. 400 pounds you know so he was going guys smaller younger agile Uh and the cool and another thing i you know in that challenger series he ended up grappling this one guy probably like this guy was probably like 200 205 but just a chiseled lean muscled up muscle bounded young kid Mm -hmm. and and keelan beat him in that division and another division gi and no gi in the challenger series and that guy, that kid, was so mad because there again, he this kid looked intimidating, but Keelan, the way he looks, and and as in like he's just soft, soft, gentle, soft spoken, mm-hmm. um, and everybody's like, man, you gotta watch that Indian boy. I mean, that, so it was kind of a cool thing. It's like you watch that Indian boy because mm-hmm. everybody was saying that because he was beating everybody, he was submitting people, choking everybody. I mean. Doing exactly, and I've only taught him a couple of submissions because it's such an entry level jiu-jitsu Because we're we're like ninety five percent all everybody started from scratch, ninety five percent of our membership. So where everybody is all learning entry level jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. and he won with entry level jiu-jitsu and entry level submissions like arm triangles and north and south choke. Mm-hmm. That was like the only two submissions I've taught them. The all them people as per much all I've taught them really. You know, maybe a cross collar choke here and there, but. It was cool to see him apply everything that we taught 
And that makes in that moment there, it makes you like proud to be the coach and proud that, that you have people that are actually applying things and realistic and cool thing is a native boy too, you know, because mm-hmm. I think, and people are coming out because he's going to be good. And, a, a, yeah, and like high, high level black belts was coming up to me because like, I said, he's, he's kind of a diamond in the rough. I said, I said he's going to be good in a few years. I mm-hmm. said, oh. So I was telling Keelan that too. I was like, hey dude, I got, I got these cats are coming up to me. It's like, I said, you're going to be great one day. So that kind of gave him some boost of energy, of, of my energy. But as just as kind of the confidence is like, and I think he's he's kind of he's real subtle and real quiet with it, you know. And mm-hmm. he he doesn't he doesn't have too much emotion, you know. But he kind of seems smile and all that. And and I, hope, I have to bring you, or maybe bring him on one day because yeah. I think he has an a, 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 an idea of like he's going to progress really good in jiu-jitsu because you know he's he's a heavier he, he's he's a heavyweight. So I'm I'm not sure how how heavy he is. You know, he could be two twenty five, two thirty, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But he's got a great wrestling base, but also he's got the knowledge of wanting to improve in jujitsu. Um, he's he, he, he took his his, I, his little one's probably I think just months old, probably six seven months old maybe. Took took him up on the podium with him, you know. So we got a picture with him holding holding him, mm-hmm. you know, on the podium. So he's a he's an amazing father, you know. Um, and that, and especially in the native community, it's great to see that having like amazing dads taking care of their little ones you know and, yeah. and and having a great uh family you know around it the wife and and all that you know his lady and and uh so that's cool to see and still see how they compete you know together because like sometimes he'll stay home with the little one let her train or vice versa they'll or he or she'll stay home let him train so they're on the same team mm-hmm. so they're helping each other get better help out. Yeah. I watched the little one, your turn. All right. Kind of thing like that. Or they'll have somebody there. Maybe the grandmother watched the little one for one night and they both can show up. So that's cool. That family does that, you know, and I love to see that, you know, and especially from where I'm from, it's great to see family and then still be, uh, amazing fathers, you know, and, 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 and why, and mothers too, in the native community, you know, that's pretty, that's awesome to see, you know, mm-hmm. especially at the young age, he's only 21, you mm-hmm. know, most 21 native dads, you know, usually sometimes ain't really too much in the, in the lives as much, you yeah. know, they're still roaming around, roaming the streets, acting the fool kind of thing, but he's, uh, it's awesome to see, it's awesome to see that he's going to be a guy that other guy i'm gonna almost like the where i used to pass it as in being a role model for the native and, and creek county i see him somebody that i'm passing a torch off to to lead by example yeah so that's pretty awesome a true gentleman yeah he yeah. is he definitely is you know whenever you have him on this show eventually yeah you'll see exactly what i'm talking about for sure man you yeah. gotta bring him on and fuck man we'll just yeah talk it up about like uh i, I, I could just imagine like how much he's going to grow, you yeah. know, staying in this, uh, oh. jujitsu MMA, you know, whatever <clears throat> yeah, you exactly. think he'll go to MMA. I, I don't know if he'll do MMA, but I think jujitsu is kind of what he, he loves because just cause I think cause he wrestled. Mm-hmm. So it kind of, it, it correlates together really easy, easier for him. Mm-hmm. I think he's always wanted to do jujitsu and never had had opportunity until I moved to his backyard. That's kind of where he's at. And, uh, like I said, uh, I think I'm gonna try to get Paul Pajero to do a story on him if I can. Mm-hmm. Maybe he can get a hold of the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation to do a story on him, just because I mean, nine. I couldn't imagine doing nine matches in one day. Yeah, and and and, and, and most of those guys were bigger than me. Yeah, or and most of those guys was just chiseled specimens of a man, and he handled them. You mm-hmm. know, so it, that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Man, that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty impressive, man. Yeah. Keelan Bear Paul, it's a name you gotta re- remember in Jiu-Jitsu world. Shout out Keelan. You know, you're going to be on soon. Yep. Work out of time. <laughs> so, man, that's pretty awesome, man. I like to hear stuff like that, dude. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. What would you say? Th- three golds and one yeah, silver? Yeah, three gold and one silver. Yeah. And I get, and then like, like one, like, like the uh, Challenger Series medal was like, was like. Oh, damn. This big around. Gold. Yeah. And this is American AGF Grab Federation. And then the rest of them were just monster gold medals and silver medals and all that. Mm-hmm. And so he would have had two of those, two of the big ones. But he, got, but he got DQ'd. Yeah. And so that's why he got that one silver. Uh, but he would have had two little gold medals, two little, two gold medals and then two of the large ones um, if he didn't get that heel up. Because that was for the finals. That mm-hmm. match was for, was for the finals in the Challenger Series. And 
and he would have won that. I think I, I believe he would have won that one. You know, mm-hmm. so that'd be crazy. Crazy, did you, but still. Did you record them? Yeah, I recorded most of them. Yeah, I recorded most of them. I want to watch them. Sure did. Yeah, yeah, I recorded most of them. Sure did. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely have to show it to him sometime. Yep. Yeah. Sure will. Yep. And that was, uh, you said a couple weeks ago? That was last Sunday. That was last Sunday. Okay, last so Sunday, I could still find ago. it. Yeah, last yeah. Few, few days ago. Um, yeah, and so it's 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 the person that nobody thought was going to be good. You know, because you, you don't judge, that's why you don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Yeah, you don't judge, because everybody did, and everybody got punked out. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah, what's up? What's yeah, up? That's what's happening? My diamond in the rough. Yeah. As that one guy said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool, man. Damn. Yeah. And yeah, he's still young and shit. Yeah, still young. I mean, still young and got crazy talent and like. Energy. Yeah. Just... I mean, for nine matches. Oh, God, man. There's no way. I can imagine that. Even when I was like 23, like I did four and I was like, oh, God, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> so... yeah. I mean, yeah, he's like. Oh, just check this out. So him and his and his lady are language instructors in Sepulpa for the YouTube program. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So besides doing what he does as in the jiu-jitsu world, being an, uh, a, a language instructor and teacher, mm-hmm. I mean, dude, this dude has all the qualities of... of of, a role model. A role model. Yeah. Gosh, man. I mean, that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And, and also in Creek, Creek County... Small town of Creek County, but also it does have a huge native community, and then people like him that are being amazing leaders. Man, mm-hmm. it's just pretty incredible. Damn. Yeah. Hell yeah. So for yeah. sure, man. Fuck, I'd be honored to have him on here. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, you'll get him. You'll get him over soon. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to schedule something up. We'll watch a video. I'll show you a video after we get down. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm down to see him. Down to see him dominate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, so what, what came first? Was it, uh, strike force or the, uh, the combat league? Uh, let's see. Let's see. It was a real combat league. Was real first. combat league. Yeah. So when we was doing really well in the, in the, in the Tulsa shows with the Dale Cook shows, well, Chuck Norris hollered, g- gave Dale Cook a call and said, Hey, th- this is what my plan is. This is what I got going. Oh, Do you have anybody that would fit what I'm looking for? And he goes, yeah, I got, I got, I can get a team together. And because I got this guy, you know, so he started talking about talking about me. And then mm-hmm. at that time, there was a female because there was a five guys and one girl per team, and he had a first string and second string, so he had two at each weight classes. Okay, because because the way the World Combat League was set up, there was it's a team event, so he had f- five different weight classes, but one of those was was the ladies, and the, they had their first show was a Cotton Bow weekend. They fought. Uh, it was a well, we fought Texas. Oklahoma, we, had, we got an Oklahoma team together, and then we had a we ended up fighting the Texas uh, team. So that's how I got my start with the World Combat League. And the cool thing is, like Chuck Norris calls Dale Cook, and then I guess they used to chat it up back in the day or whatever. And and uh, and and at that time, I'm glad that was my window of hey, I got this Thomas, I got this, I got this lady, lady Jerry Stites, and then I think it was Toby Tillman. You know, at that time, I think he was a Tulsa Talon. You know, he was in a, a kind of a, a heavyweight. So he was our heavyweight at the time. And then, um, so we had a fighting in Texas, and it was actually the same weekend as a Cotton Bowl to where it was, you know, Longhorns and OU was playing the same day. And the same, and in downtown, we were fighting. I can't remember what, what arena we were, downtown Dallas, but we ended up fighting, and it was a World Combat League. So it was the very first showing. And that's how that thing started. And then, and then after that, you know, we had like five or six shows per season. I mm-hmm. did like two. I think I think it was like World Comedy lasted about two or three seasons, and I fought all of them. So at that time, Strike Force was was came about World Com- World Combat League, WEC, uh, all these small shows was like crazy, 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 all going on at the same time. And I think World Combat League kind of somewhat fills it out because everybody was on the MMA hype train because, and so it over, it overshadowed a lot of world combat league. Now it, people are like, man, we wish they brought world combat league back because it was, it was, it was high velocity, high take. I mean, high knockouts, striking where everybody likes to see is knockouts. Let's go. And, and, and so that was the cool thing about it. But because the MMA was such a new on the rise and all these promotions was, was blown up everywhere else. It kind of, it, it caused WCL to kind of fizzle out, you know, mm-hmm. lost a lot of funding and this and that. Because for a while there, you know, well, pretty much a whole time, Chuck Norris was 
funding everything. Damn. He was paying all of us, you know, um, because the ticket sales wasn't crazy. It started, you know, a couple of shows, a couple of shows was pretty good sold out. Like every time it came, every time it came to Tulsa, we sold it out because Tulsa already had a great following of fighters. And at that time I was already high into fighting. So everybody, we had a great following in Tulsa. So like at the pavilion, the expo, we fought there, both those places, and we sold those out each time. And also, and it definitely helped out that Chuck Norris was there too. Uh, we fought down, and we fought also downtown at the, um, I think it was the Civic Center. Yeah, we did one of those. Yeah, that was during the Ice Storm, we, Ice Storm year, when we had a very limited crowd, but they almost shut down the whole town of Tulsa during that Ice Storm. Because I, I remember we fought, they brought us in because they almost shut that one, the show down, but we still had people show up for it. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't think Chuck Norris was there for that one because of the ice storm kind of thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, like Tulsa shows was sold out. World Combat League was was happening in Tulsa. And um, and then that's when, when it fizzled out, then that's when I transitioned to MMA. Um, so that's when I had my first MMA fight. And I fought in the, at the Miami, Miami, Oklahoma, at the Buffalo Run Casino there. My first MMA fight. And then after that was um, Hard Rock. Uh, Hard Rock. Yeah, Hard Rock was the next MMA fight and Spirit Bank Center a few times. Spirit Bank, I think Spirit Bank is probably, well, I say my favorite. Brady Theater is probably my favorite venue I fought at. Oh, but, damn. But, but uh, probably Spirit Bank was probably my number two favorite place because it was a cool venue. It had that Big Daddy feel to, uh, to it also. And we still sold that place out before too. So when you get that huge crowd there at Spirit Bank Center, I mean, that's pretty awesome. You know, have you been to Spirit Bank Center before? I've I've seen it. Like it's 100, in um, 101st and like Memorial. Yeah. Or not. Uh, uh, sh uh, yeah, you're right. Memorial. Yeah, Memorial. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I've seen the outside of it. I've never been inside there. Inside, yeah. So it was it was a, it was a cool feel, and and especially when you pack it out, it create amazing energy there. Uh, I wish they did more things with it. You know, I, I mean, I think for a while they probably didn't do too much. I think they had some powwows there too. Oh, really? Yeah, because I remember going to I think one or two of them there but uh but yeah it was a cool venue and that's when the mma started and the strike force thing happened so the strike force actually came they came to tulsa so that was strike force fight was in tulsa so there again a great following soldered out you know great i mean daniel cormier was there oh, follow nice. my card mm -hmm. um tim kennedy um tyrone woodley was there so before these guys were big time they was fighting you know on the same car that I fought on. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was cool. You know, because we've done a couple of things with Tim Kennedy here recently with War Tribe. Mm -hmm. War Tribe was a jiu-jitsu brand that I kind of rocked for a long time and still do. But he was like one of our sponsored athletes. So I got to kind of hang out with him every now and then, pick in and do seminars with him. Um, he's a cool cat, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a cool thing. Is that everybody's like, I said, yeah, Tyron Woodley fought with, on the same card as me. And we were in the same locker room. And Daniel Cormier, when I think it was his very first MMA fight, I believe. Um, so that was pretty awesome there, just to be on the same card. Because they said, yeah, you know, I fought on. At that time, I think. I think somebody said something here recently, like the two UFC title holders. I said, you fought with them, you know, you know, cause at that time, I think like Daniel had a, had a title and Tyrone had a title. Oh yeah. And somebody made a shout out when at that time, cause yeah, I remember Thomas, you fought on the same card as they, them two guys, you know, and I said, damn small. Nobody knew that, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, nobody thought they was going to go that place, you know, that high level, but that was pretty cool to, to share a rock locker room with them, you know, at that one, that was my, I guess my moment, I guess too. strike fighting on strike force. Live television, you know, fighting. Uh, who's that? Fight? Oh, Travis Kalanick. He was like L.A. Not L.A. Yeah, he was L.A. Boxing's like number one guy. He was undefeated. I was undefeated, mm -hmm. and so it was. It was just a great matchup, and then it was, you know, and I had a bunch of family there too, cousins and and all that, you know, yelling in, in the audience and, and the hooping out there and all that too. So that was pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. So that's kind of how that worked out. As in World Combat League, once it fizzled out with the Chuck Norris thing, then then that's the MMA took over. Mm -hmm. And after MMA took over, I kind of stayed with that, and then slowly went to uh, I had a boxing match with another big crazy rivalry. George Tadanapper was like the the boxing the native community boxing guy locally. Mm -hmm. He fought a lot on these uh, casinos, not around Tulsa, but they they had him fight. I think like Oklahoma City side of town casinos a lot. And anyway. How this fight got going, we'll get off topic pretty quick, but going right to boxing. This guy claimed to be the baddest Native American fighter, and I got wind of that. I was like, <laughs> oh, really? So I was like, 
And I was like, well, I think I might have called him out first. Because he called, I was like, I'm the best. He's the best. I said, okay, let's see how bad you are. I said, hey, how about this? I think I, I ended up calling him out. I said, hey, how about this? So we'll fight. I'll fight you on your terms. I said, I haven't, and he was like 24 and 0 and like 23 knockouts, professional boxer. I said, I got no boxing. I said, I'll challenge you to a fight on your rules and all that. So we ended up hyping this thing up. Um, and to where we had it at the Hard Rock Casino. Mm -hmm. We had back then, you know, locally, nobody did any kind of. Almost, almost like uh, like like the UFC does uh, embedded oh yeah and stuff like that now. Well, back in there we back then when we was doing we was creating we had like a film crew on each side that did like hype YouTube videos against like talking trash or posse or this and that to where that he made one I made one mm -hmm. he made one I made so we promoted and hyped this own fight ourselves you know as in like with him and my and me because. Um, there again, he claimed to be the best. I said, all right, how about this? Well, I'll challenge you. I'll fight at your level or fight at your, I'll fight, fight your whatever weight class you are. At that time, I was at one, I fought 145. I think he fought at 64. Mm -hmm. That was his weight class in boxing. And, um, I said, I'll fight whatever weight class. I'll fight, I'll fight you boxing. Let's see how bad you are. I said, I ain't boxing. I'm fighting. I said, I ain't, I ain't boxing you. I said, I'm going I'm to try to tear your head off. You know, so that was my mentality going in. Yeah. And we we created these hype videos on YouTube, and they're up. You know, like I run my mouth on him, and he sends one back because he'd say I'm, I'm bigger. He goes, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm faster. You know, he's got his videos and his posse behind him. You know, so we kind of <laughs> <laughs> we kind of one of those things. And, That's awesome. Uh, and uh, so we end up. I mean, oh, check this out. So he he was on a, he was doing a radio interview. I end up figuring out somebody. Hey, you know. Comanche Boy, that's his name. Comanche yeah, Comanche Boy. Boy I remember that, yeah. Comanche Boy is doing a live, live uh, radio interview right now. Because once you call in, so I end up calling in. Hey, we got a caller. <laughs> we got a caller coming in. Blah blah blah. And I'm going to say, Comanche Boy. Hey, it's Whoa. Thunder Kick, and here he goes, run his dang mouth. I said, you come, come February, whatever. I said, you're gonna find out. You're gonna find out. So that was another thing too. I called it on his own, own radio show one time and he's doing a, a, a live, uh, radio and, uh, <laughs> I ended up, I ended up calling him out like more. And there again, he started, he goes, you ain't native. He's, I, mean, I don't know why he had to do all that. You know, he started like, you ain't this, you ain't that. Cause I said, I get it. Comanche nation. You guys are, you guys are legit. I get it. But it's, but you ain't the only tribal place people either. So, but they, I think different, I think also different tribes hold different standards and they're like, well, you're not pure blood, blah, blah. Well, I'm not a pure blood. I'm a half breed, but still I got native blood in me. Mm -hmm. So there's no, I get the old, old style mentality is like, you ain't fool. You, you don't have any kind of things. Some were like that. I get that. But, but also he was, he was doing that. He was, he was kind of playing that card with me. I was like, man, that's not right. I said, come February, whatever. I'm going to show you. In your boxing ring, all that you ain't the toughest around, you know. So we kind of got got like that. So anyway, Hard Rock happens, it sells it out. Hard Rock has never had that kind of capacity crowd ever, ever, and still, still to date, they had they had, they had to bring in like extra like hundred and fifty chairs Damn. to the floor, uh -huh. to the stage, in the aisles there, and then they couldn't have no more capacity, and then they had to do a live stream in Toby Keith's restaurant. So we had people in the lobbies, and then Toby Keith was packed out because people was watching it in the Toby Keith restaurant. Uh -huh. So they figured out how to make it a live stream in there. So that's where they were sending everybody that couldn't get a ticket. So like I said, that was the biggest fight. And you can almost cut it down the middle, like his people and my people too. Because there was boxing matches on that night. But uh, I ended up coaching and cornering a guy on that same card that I fought on. I did that multiple times. I fought on the same cards that I was coaching. Mm -hmm. I did it a bunch where I'm ha I got my hands wrapped and I'm coaching from the sides because I'm next in like four fights. I'll be the main event or toward the end of the night. I was like the, the headliner. So I did that multiple times. So I was wrapping his hands and then getting now it's my turn to get ready. And I mean, there was like fights breaking out in the, in the, up in the stands because it was like, Everybody's jawing back and forth. Damn. I mean, it was it was Whoa. pretty vicious. People get escorted out. I mean, it was it was one of those, but it was a pride thing. It was like his people versus my people. You know, it was cool to see, but not to that capacity. But it was yeah. cool to see a lot of so much natives was there. Yeah. I mean, it was like, and he brought a lot of people from where he was too. You know, he brought everybody to America. So he had a huge fan base. 
I did too. I mean, they're getting at it in the stands and going that. So it was, it was cool to see because everybody had their, they were, they're, they're, they're being, I guess, uh, I say as like just being honored to be a part of something like that, you know? And, uh, but like I said, we had a, we had a, I think we went five, it was a five round fight. We went to distance and a lot of people think, thought that that should have been a draw. Why should, why shouldn't it have been? I chased him around for five rounds. You know, he was one of those, he was a, he was a true boxer, stick and move, run, run, stick and move and run. You know, where I was trying to chunk, come at him and try to tear his head off. You know, <laughs> he lit me up. I lit him up, but he stayed away from me the whole time because I was kind of like that. Like I was the, I was, I was the pressure kind of thing. As in like, I'm moving forward. I'm chasing you around that ring. And so, it was, and then even Ricky, uh, Ricky Hatton, Ricky Hatton. Is that his boxing name? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, he 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 scored it as a draw. I had him as a special guest, and he because I think at that time he came also because he was helped promoting his new movie about him. I think there was a story. I think there's a movie out. Uh, I'm trying to think who was who was that movie. We have to look it up. It's on. It, it, it is a movie about him, Ricky Hatton story. Um, and there was a movie. I'm trying to think who was in it. Dang it, who was in it? Jar Butler? No, Jar Butler. Kristen Bell. I think Kristen Bell was was in it. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, it's a boxing show. Anyway, it's about him. It's his story about boxing. And that's why they brought him in as a special guest. And he was a special guest judge, too. And he was he had a, a draw. And why not? Because we, why wouldn't they? I mean, and, and I, I lost the decision. I was like, you got to be kidding. We got so many boo- boos and all that. But I ended up rupturing my, rupturing my eardrum that fight. I couldn't hear nothing because I'm deaf in one ear already, and I ruptured my good ear, so I was deaf. Oh. I was about ninety percent deaf for about three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. So that was a scary. Where I was like, man, I think I'm done. I don't want to do this. I don't, that's too much risky. I was close. I was reading lips for three weeks, you know, and and you know, it's just a terrible feeling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, they should have ran it back and did another one, just because of the money him and I made. And also the crowd, the money we brought to the casino. Yeah. Of how many people? I mean, they, they sold out like there was no rooms to stay at in hotel. I mean, their their money they made the casino money. You know, as in like because everybody gambled. Mm-hmm. You know, and all the food they bought. I mean, why not business wise? Why don't they run that back again to do it again? Mm-hmm. What well, at the end of that fight, I was like, all right, come here, you boy. I fought your game. Now come fight my game. And then I didn't hear nothing. He goes to me after that, you know. He's like, "Now nah, I ain't fighting that boy on kickboxing." Or I said, "I'll give you box or MMA. You you pick, mm-hmm. you know." But no, that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. But I say he, he's doing. I mean, from right now, I said giving him props as, and he's doing. You know, he's been. I think he's got a little ones, a couple of little ones, I think. And he, and uh, I see a lot of videos. We're social media friends too, and I see him coaching. His boys are wrestling. I think he wrestled in school. Uh, but yeah, I see a lot of stuff on that he's done with his boys at wrestling. Sound like a lot of a lot of live stream wrestling I see. So that's pretty awesome that he's embedded in his family and his kids on on supporting them and and coaching them and pushing them. So I see a lot of cool stuff from him still. So that's mm-hmm. pretty awesome. So was that both of y'all's last fight, or do you uh, know? I think, I think he I think he did a couple more boxing matches, and I think he, after that he hung, he hung it up. And then me. I think I end up. Uh, I, I fought a couple more times kickboxing. Oh, yeah. I did a kickboxing fight and an MMA fight after that. Uh, my last one was an MMA legacy fight at the Hard Rock too. And my some, was my last couple of fights were at the Hard Rock. And then after that, I called it. I called it quits. I was I was done just because I didn't have time. This time to, as it, it takes a lot of time to train like you need to. It takes a lot of time, and uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I just kind of fizzled out after that. I was like, eh, I'm done. I said, I think I'm done. My body just wouldn't, I can't train like I need to because I'm all taped up like an old man. You know, you see these guys with elbow pads and knee pads and, you know, like the old guys used to play basketball. Yeah. I didn't want to be that guy that's trying to spar and have a neck brace on and crazy pads. It was like the Michelin man with all <laughs> all padded up cowboy collar and shoulder pads and trying to spar. I don't yeah. want to be that guy. I was like, nah. I said, I, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta think long term. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to be these guys gonna be punch drunk growing up and having issues and all that. And I know when to go out. I was like, I don't want to get throttled to death and get knocked out four or five times easy each fight like these other guys. You see that, you know, mm-hmm. especially in the MMA world, you know, like the Chuck Liddells and Randy Couture's and and guys that are just easily getting dropped and knocked out. Well, it just you get older, things like that happen. So I didn't want to ever get to that point where I'm getting embarrassed, you know. So I was kind of like, I'm just gonna bow out slowly and 
Yeah. I, I have my war stories I can go through every now and then. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But that's but good. Yeah. That's yeah. good though. Like you knew when to stop. Yeah. Cause a lot of people, man, they just, they want to, but it's like, I want to keep going. Yeah. You know? There's a lot of guys even right now, they keep wanting to fire. I said, quit fighting, man. I said, you ain't winning. Mm-hmm. And you're getting punked out every time. Stop. I, I get it. It's in you. Yeah. But find a different avenue to get to keep that edge. You know, yeah. that's the thing. I went to jiu-jitsu to kind of keep that edge. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like I always tell the guys my story. Of the, I always go back to Rocky movies, Rocky films. It's something like, remember Apollo Creed was telling Rocky about, you know, if there's no war to fight, then the warrior might as well be dead kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I've thought that same way. But that's what jiu-jitsu filled the void of fighting. You know, where I can still compete with young pups. I can still manhandle you a little bit. I can still feel alive again. I can feel smashed, and I can feel how to overcome. I can almost throw up, you know, because I get to still keep that feeling going, that still competitiveness of just trying to improve, trying to keep up my pace with these young guys, you know, because I want to be able to handle, hang with 20-year-olds, Yeah. you know, and because sometimes I might have to, like, alpha male up one night. It's like, come on, you guys going to see how tough you are? Cause I still have, I still got to do that sometimes at the gym, you know, but that's where Daryl Wilson takes over. Cause he's a lot younger than me. So I'm like, <laughs> Daryl, it's time to green light that cat. I can't do it, but you need to, you know, <laughs> when guys go a little too hard, you guys, you got these newer guys or, or guys that just go too hard in sparring or even grappling. Mm-hmm. We call it getting green lighted. And so, so he's like, all right, he's green lighted. So that means you go in there and try to hurt him. Yeah. Hurt him with that permanently hurt him, but like try to drop him or hurt, knock him out, you know, or something like that, or put this guy to sleep because he's just acting a fool, trying to hurt people. So you get Matt Justice, we call it Matt Justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also want to ask you too. Uh, this one time on uh, it was like a Saturday, I think, and you know you go live for mm-hmm. sparring. This is when you're still at Promenade. Yeah, I was want to ask, man. Uh, there's this one session where this this dude was like. I don't know. He's like running his mouth and he was wanting to like go against Daryl or something. Yeah. And, but yeah, then when the Daryl, when Daryl went, when Daryl was like, um, you know, he said, yeah, let's go. He kept like running from him. And so Daryl, you know, was getting frustrated and, uh, he was like, come on, you want to talk shit or something? Like it was getting like yeah. real, it's getting yeah. real, you know? Right. And, um, I think I was watching it. And I was like, "What's going on? Like, is this is this really happening?" <laughs> I, know. I, was, I know. So I kind of kept a live stream going. So I, I do remember that. I exactly remember what you're talking about because it, what it was was like, uh, it was this guy. You know, it was, it was just. I think we we had to correct him during sparring because he was doing something he wasn't supposed to. As in, like, we had we have state uh, little circle rounds yeah. or little areas where they kind of people to stay at. Well, he was always getting out of his spot and getting bumping into somebody else. I said, dude, stay in your, that was it. Stay in your zone, stay mm-hmm. in your spot. I said, and, but it's like, everybody else doing it, everybody else doing it. I said, no, they wasn't, you know, he, but he was, but cause we was getting on to him. He started turning into something totally different. Like you guys, we kind of come on to him. I said, no, I said, but he ran his mouth too. Cause, cause oh, we'll go. I said, we'll fight right now. I said, what? and then Daryl pretty much got tired of it. Yeah. Cause sometimes that's going to happen. You don't get those mouthy people, emotional people. And and then sometimes we just gotta pull your card and said, Okay, well we'll come over then. Come over let's go. I said you'd rather want to handle a situation like that in a controlled environment than yeah. out there because that's when things get really get hurt. You know, hey if Daryl throttles you, I said that's fine, I can pull him off or he'll just stop. You mm-hmm. know? If you guys are out there in the street and he does it, he might not pull off, he might just stomp you on the curb and then and, and crack your face open, you know. Mm-hmm. Here I can stop it. You know, so once you have y'all handle it and get it handled here, you know, because then you got a controlled environment, you know, you put gloves on and get at it, you know, but yeah, it was one of those things I had to, I kept the live stream going and I wish if I would have been smart, I would have kept it, you know, pointed that direction. Cause mm-hmm. I think I had it against my chest and nobody, but everybody can hear everything was going yeah, on. The, I seen everybody I making remember. comments. What's going on? I can't see. What are you going on? <laughs> I see some people <laughs> making comments about it. But I never heard anything more from that guy, you know, cause Daryl was, was so mad. He was pissed and mad at yeah. this guy. He's like, I'm, he goes, I'm tired of it. I'm going to, let's go, you know, kind of thing. And that guy was backing off and he goes, and that guy was, Saying I don't want none or saying like, let's go, but he was backing off and run at the same time, mm-hmm. and uh, he was just that mentality. So he came from a rough side of town, mm-hmm. and I get he had a fight. And that guy had a fight for everything. He had to prove himself, but it's different when you 
when you're around trained lions, yeah. you can't pull that tough guy no more because we do this on the regular. Yeah. You know, we do this every day. We punch each other for every week. When you got guys that come in and think that they're tough, well, okay, well, let's go. Well, then it's like they start changing their tone real quick or they back up with their hands up. Where are you going? Get, come back. I ain't chasing you. Mm. If you're tough, let's go. You know, so that did happen. Yeah, that did definitely happen. You know, and, and I had that often. In, I had that in Texas one time. Somebody showed up at LA Boxing. He said, like, who's the toughest guy here? And uh, and the, the owner at the time, he goes, that guy up there in the ring. And because uh, I want, I want to go, I want to go against him, and and he come up to the ring, you know, at, it was a boxing ring, so I kind of leaned over the ropes. So, hey, this guy wants to go out, go after, or go with some of you. He wants to check and see if you're any good. I said, well, let's have him sign the waiver, and so they signed the waiver <laughs> and all that. He come in, and uh, I think you know, he, him, he had three, three or four guys with him too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, because there ain't no telling what happened. They probably could have had a couple of beers, or I don't know, and uh, they come in. I said, I can make sure he signs the waiver. They said, we gear up and all that. So during cardio kickboxing class, so my one of my guys, he was teaching. He stops class, he, and then the other guy stops class. So everybody's gathered around the ring now. So I was like, oh, gosh, I better show up. I ain't going to let this guy catch me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was a little bit, little, little bit bigger. I mean, nothing, not crazy bigger, just a little bit. Um, I think he was just taller. But he was game. I said, ding, ding. I said, we're going. I said, we got three minutes. He said, okay. So he come out like a whirlwind of fire, just slugging it out. I knew he's going to last about 10, 15 seconds. He's going to gas out and get tired. So I was weathering the storm. Glad I didn't want to get caught in a situation where both exchanging and get caught. So I was just kind of weathering the storm, blocking, 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 letting him wear himself out. And then I'm just, and then once I kind of see him started gassing, then I think it was, all right, now it's my turn. So I started wearing his body out and smash, smash, smash. I ended up dropping the body shot. And then, uh, and then he, 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 he kind of laid down on the ground for a second. He come back up, and I haven't done no kicks just yet either. And then all right, we go back at it again. I said, dude, I, we got two more minutes left. I said, stand up. Stand up. Let's go. So him and his boy, they talked him back up. He stands stand back up again. There again, he gives me about 10 seconds of, of hail, pretty much just swinging and slugging it out kind of thing. And then I felt him starting to stop as in like catching, gasping for air and breathing, and that's my turn. Boom. I started punch, punch, kind of com- combination, but chasing him over to the corner. Mm-hmm. I got him to a position where he's kind of right there against the ropes, and I, st- and I kind of sidestep, and I stole a round kick, shin kick right to his body, and it drops him, knocks his mouthpiece out, and he's like, you know, he's over kind of like just curled up in a ball. And then I think after that, he said, that's it. I can't do it anymore. But I said, I said we got another minute left. I said, huh? <laughs> he quit. He quit. He started taking his gloves off right oh. there. And so... That was it, and then, uh, yeah, they never obviously they never come back. But uh, yeah, so that was kind of what was, I, that's happened. Every now and then it happens, yeah. you know. But once you tell somebody, like, say, I'm gonna be here tomorrow, I'll bring my gear, they never show up. Mm-hmm. Or it's like, y'all, I'll come tomorrow, I'll spar with you. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. So bring your gear, they never show up, you know. So I think once you finally you confront them, when people are like that, he's like, all right, tomorrow night, bring your stuff. They never. I mean, they they get, they get the, a taste of. Uh, of the realism is like crap this guy is not playing yeah you know and i was like no nah, i don't want that yeah uh, yeah so and, and that and that happens every now and then too but that's fine because you know you know they understand they, they see that it's nothing to us because it's just another day at the office but to their world they might have never had a fight in three or four years and never been in type of training or anything like that and it's like eh, nah I'll, I'll pass you know so yeah <laughs> So watch out, tough guys. Don't you get your card pulled. <laughs> For real, it's you're you're pretty much falling into that lion. Uh, what's it called at the zoo? For you? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, lion. Yeah, lion. The den, lion den. Yeah, lion den, you're pretty lion. much falling into that if you go into the gym and you're like, I'm here to fuck shit up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because if it's a five minute round and like, so, and because because we'll get some guys that that come in sometimes just like that. And yeah. Like, well, we're just going we'll to do some, we'll just do a, we'll just grapple, you know? And there's like two minutes in, they're gas because they ran their mouth so much. He's like, nope, huh? We got three more minutes. Let's mm-hmm. go. And then they usually, they quit and walk off, you know? Um, so you get that sometimes. Yeah. And we got that at Promenade Mall because Promenade Mall, we usually got those stragglers. Yeah. Those thugs, want to be fighters kind of thing. They would show up and I said, sign the waiver. And they would come in their sh- in their in their in their chains and wife beaters and and keep their socks on and and uh, we give them blocks and gloves. So, 
I just want to box. Okay, we'll just box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they still couldn't handle that type of pressure. And especially we put them up against the wall and the, in the cage and all that. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. I said, nah, let's work. Let's go. Come on. You know, so, uh, yeah, so it, it, it was, it was fun at the, because you get to, they, 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 they hated being humbled. Yeah. Cause they didn't, they don't like that. You know, they just throw, the, throw their gloves off and leave, you know, kind of thing like that. And that's, oh, well, you know, it's part of it. It's a lesson that needs to be learned. Yes. Yeah. You, you need to get your ass handed to you every <laughs> yeah. now and then. For sure. It's, <laughs> it's a different feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been there. I've been there. I've been, Yeah. <laughs> I've been humbled plenty of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes you respect. That yeah. You ain't, you ain't all that. Yeah. You ain't all that. <laughs> that is like, for sure. That's like gold uh, advice right there. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, if you want to try it, sign that waiver. Make yeah, sure you sign, sign that, that fucking waiver and get in there. Yeah. <laughs> Better you back up what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true. So true. <laughs> Gosh dang. Uh so like, damn man, like I've been uh I've been like uh you know, we're friends on Facebook yeah. and you know now I'm seeing you transition into acting. Yeah. You know, how yeah. how's that going? That's you know? going or on. how'd you get into that? So how I got into that was uh before roofing, I always had that time to where I could not take time off for things. Oh yeah, we have this thing coming up, but you're gonna be gone for a couple of days, or we need you to be here tomorrow at ten o'clock for to try out try or auditions or whatever mm -hmm. well i could never do that because i have a, I had a job to where yeah, you just can't take off and leave but with roofing you know roofing with thomas shout out uh call him up shout out it's so i pretty much i have the more time now to do things like so i was able so since i've been doing the roofing i've been able to pursue things that i've always wanted to do mm -hmm. like uh and and one of the guys that trained at my gym jake washburn he trained at my gym in Jinx, and also he come train at my gym in, in in Tulsa at the Promenade. Well, he's he's been in the in the movie industry, done done some films, and I started seeing him do it, and I was like, hey, I want him. In, you know, he he was kind of like my my way to get in. As mm -hmm. like, cause hey, actually we're doing something here pretty quick, and I guess he's part of a little a production company here locally in Tulsa that does little little either small films or commercials or stuff like that. He goes, hey, we actually need somebody here next week. And I was like. Yeah, we're doing a Sam's Club here at Tulsa Hills. We did, we did a little Sam's because you want to speak. I said, we can't, you got to got to ad lib a little bit, and we just got to. It's a it's a silent where you're just you're moving your mouth and talking, and engaging, but we don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was like in the tire section of kind of looking at tires and walking around, and uh, out of, I, and so that was kind of my first thing. But that was because of him to kind of let me in slowly because I, I want to kind of learn slowly but surely. Don't be throwing me into something where I can't handle. Like, give me a script. I got to memorize, you know, I don't do it like that. So he did it exactly right. Like, uh, this first one, all right, you, I just need you to walk around and just kind of act like you're a customer, looking at things, kind of checking things out, and then meeting with, meet with the the one of the representatives at, Wal at Sam's, you know, about buying tires. And so we're looking at the iPad, and I'm kind of like, you know, acknowledging, giving some gestures and all that. And that was my first thing as in, in that world. And then the next option was, and actually they're doing the uh, this previewing, premiere showing of the of one I'm in. It will be this Friday. We're going to Wichita, Kansas. So, mm -hmm. backing up, the ne the name of this movie is called Death Alley, um, and uh, pretty much this one was like, hey, we're doing a show. He's one of the main characters in this film. He goes, we're going to need extras. So, what do you think about coming down for it? And it was going to be filmed in Wichita, Kansas. At Cowtown is like their, it's like a cowboy town. I mean, it's just like a cow. You're stepping back in time in a wilder days. The whole <laughs> town's like that. So when I get, so I said, yeah, I can be there. He goes, yeah, just let the note, the producer and director know, hey, you're available as many. Because I told him, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm available as much as you need me. I said, uh, just let me know what you need me to do. Because I just want to get my foot in the door and just learn the game, just kind of see what it's about, you know. So I got to learn. Show up really early, kind of get in my outfit. Go send me a picture, of kind of what you have outfit wise for a cowboy, kind of thing like that. So you know, I got my find my cowboy hat and vest and all that, and get dressed out and because all right, perfect, bring that with you. And uh, so I get, I got there. It was early, like it's like dark thirty in the mornings when they start. Everybody shows up, the cast and everything, because they got to get you fitted. If you got makeup, like, oh, okay, yeah, you look good. Okay, okay, you're fine. Um, and then, all right, we're going to shoot it. You're going to be a town militia guy. Okay. You're just going to be 
push this barrel over, run it over here, or here's your gun. You, 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 your, your, uh, your, your guns, they, they check out like a regular armory kind of thing. They have to make sure they, they got blanks and everything in. And then my first thing was like, early morning, it's freezing, it's cold, there's no coats because you just got to stay in character. So I'm wearing this long sleeve, thin, thin freaking t shirt with this vest, and it was freezing that day. But you're outside doing like 20 takes of the same exact thing. All right, go back to one position. Like, oh, all right, go back to one position. All right, all right, in action. All right, and you do you do the same thing over and over 18 times. But you start understanding the lingo that the director's calling out because if and that helped out for the next thing I started doing. So that was shot a year ago, and just now it's now being. The previewing is is now the this Friday at the drive-in in Wichita, Kansas, at one of the drive-ins because of COVID and this and that. They're doing an outside event, you know, at the drive-in in Wichita, so that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And um, um, but the cool thing about it, another great thing about it is like if we have a great turnout for this one, they might bring it to Tulsa to Admiral Twin to do it again. Oh, nice. So yeah, so Jake Washburn's a Tol- Tulsa native. He's from around this area but he's one of the main characters. So the movie's about the Dalton gang and I didn't know anything about it. And then I hear about it as actual real story. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. So it's these brothers and friends that, that rob a bank at exactly the same time. And it's right across the street from each other. So they got it in their mind that they wanted to be like the Jesse James people. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted to rob banks and make money and, and live life and all that fun stuff. So they end up, having this idea that they're going to rob a bank because I think they robbed a few banks already, but they's like, all right, we're going to pull off something that nobody's ever done. We're going to pull off. We're going to, we're going to steal from this bank. And then we're going to steal from that bank across the street from each other at the exactly same time. Well, the idea was that they were going to do that, but they knew the town didn't, ha- didn't have guns, but little they know that the, they didn't know that the town, 90% of them was all used to be town like military people, like like they, they they came back from the wars and all that. So they used to fight battles. So they ended up getting picking the wrong town because all of them was all veterans. I guess you'd say and if it was nowadays, like oh, good, we're going a bunch, we're going to a town to rob, but ninety percent of the community is nat- are, are veterans that are battle ready kind of thing. So there was like one gun shop there, and then what happens whenever they started robbing, they end up telling everybody about it, and then they all go into the armory, and then they're all loading up with guns, and that's how like that's why I told the town fights back, kind of thing like that. And I can't tell you the end of the story. I want y'all yeah. to watch it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. It's like they bring it, and then the town fe- the town people fight back. I think I posted it on my Facebook page. You can watch the trailer, but it's Death Death Alley. You can check out a YouTube trailer, um, and kind of see it for yourself. But we're doing the premiere movie thing this Friday. And then that led into uh, a friend of mine calling Matthew JC is a big director in Dallas. And he hollered at me about, Hey, we're going to shoot this Netflix series. Um, and right now we're going to shoot a sizzle. I said, I don't know what a sizzle is. I thought is that like a trailer. So I guess it's kind of like an idea concept movie concept to where it's like you show bits and pieces of the seasons and put it all into one. Cause what, what he did is he presented the idea to Netflix and they said, all right, if this is as bad as you as 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 bad a as you you're saying it is, bring us something to the table. If it's something that we'll we'll do, we'll we'll, we'll let you guys move forward with the with actually do the filming. So that's what we shot last year, last fall. We shot that for about two or three months, shooting that one. And that's this is a series is actually what's going on right top today. How the government, a virus, and this and that was going on, and then but it, it's a cool thing too to where it's you mess with the these country so my 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 role is is, is a half breed native american i'm in this one so we're, i'm part of a of a of a band of of not brothers but friends or like brothers kind of thing like that and we're involved in almost like in the drug cartel kind of it's almost like the king of queens ish style uh if you guys have seen that on netflix big i love queen queen of the south queen oh, queen right. of the south so queen of the south amazing show so ours kind of like that mo- our series will be almost like a Queen of the South break meets Breaking Bad, hmm. entwined somehow like that. Mm-hmm. So drug 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 cartels, virus, government takeover, the country boys fight back kind of thing. Um, so we shot that one. So they're they're right now they're doing the editing on that one right now to present to Netflix. And then once they see it, then we'll get approval, and then we'll start looking for funding and all that to, to shoot and start filming legit crazy mm-hmm. for it. Um, so there again, I was able to leave for a week 
on this one and come back another week later. Um, but I would never have done it without the roofing. So the roofing got to me the point where I can leave my, my, I got more opportunities to do things. You know, I could just schedule my own jobs. I can move them things around if I have to, or I can have somebody else run the job for me where I can kind of able kind of pursue my kind of thing. I always kind of wanted to do anyway, but I never really could. Mm -hmm. And my, and the cool thing is my wife supports me. It's like, yeah, go, go ahead, get yeah, it. Cause she knows I always wanted to do that. You know, I think you really do really good at it. So, and and, the, and so she went down with me to Texas when we were shooting this Netflix series. They call it a sizzle. You have to look it up on definition in the movie world what a sizzle is. But it's not a trailer. It's not a, um, I don't know. Yeah, check it out. And um, so she brought came down to visit me like the, one of the last days of the filming. And he goes, hey, actually, we need this part. So she ended up having to get to be in it, too. So they ha they gave her a role, a speaking role, and then a driving role nice. out of nowhere. Because actually, we need somebody. Hey, how about you? So she ended up doing that in front of everybody. And she goes, uh, yeah, sure. Goes, well, your car your character needs to be nervous. Uh, and she goes, well, I got that down perfect because I've never done this before. So I'll be perfect. <laughs> so she had a cool a role uh, in that. So she like it was almost like a curfew. It got to So her thing was like at a certain time, the town shuts down. You can't be out after 9 o'clock. Unless you have like, unless you're like a uh, uh, like a doctor or, or police guy or whatever, so it 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 is kind of how the story could go with the world right now, but it probably isn't. But it was just it was just a cool story format because it's like a virus takeover, over, the town shuts down, the government shuts things down. You can only be out at a certain time, and after that, you got to have a chip either in your arm or on your on on something to where you can let you know that you're a. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what kind of I could say, as in like, um, I don't know. What's some people that, uh, that one time you could only work only if you were a central worker. Yeah. Yeah. Central yeah, worker. Work. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you can only be out if you was a central worker or something like that. That's mm -hmm. the only reason you could have a pass, a whole pass to be out, you know, kind of thing. Um, so that was fun because I got to be my, I got to be my, um, I'm quiet, but vicious person where I was the, I was the friend that took care of everybody in the background, but I was the guy that always going to fight it any second. If you needed me, I'm, I'm, I'm down kind of thing like that. So I'm, I'm the guy that just the, the go chain and the, and the, and, and the look, Oh, Oh, my, my character was the cigar guy that smoked all, oh, I always had a cigar in my mouth. So I was kind of, I was kind of like the, the Jesse Ventura, I guess, or in predator kind of like where he always oh, had that big old cigar. Yeah. He's about. So I got to be the cigar guy. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so that, that's going to be in the editing mode right now. And now also here is, uh, the kills of the flower moons coming. So I did, uh, did try out for that. Made it all the way to the very end of speaking role in front of everybody. Like the, to do like a casting, uh, uh, a crew that you got to speak, do your lines in front of the camera and all that. So I got to make it all the way into that. And just here recently, they sent out a thing to, all right, we need native Americans that can ride horses. You know, I saw that. So yeah. I I put my name in that because I can ride one, mm -hmm. um, but he's like, they want to know your experience level. I was like, I, I say I'm an inter intermediate. That's fine. I can ride a horse. I'm athletic. I'll figure it out real quick. You know. Mm -hmm. So just getting my foot in the door with that too. So I just want to get my foot in the door and get in front of in front of somebody that I was like, hey, actually, I want actually I want him to do this role, so that could lead into something too. You know, just just by being there, it's actually, we're gonna have you do a speaking role or actually I want you to be his sidekick now, you know, so mm -hmm. it could turn into something just cause until they get eyes on you, you don't really know, but I'm just going to get my opportunity and let's give me a shot. You know, yeah. let's, let's see what I can do. Cause I can do this, this and this and this and this man. You know, the cool thing about the Netflix thing is like, I was, I was, I got to be the fight choreographer. I got to be the stunt guy because Hey, he goes, can you ride four wheeler? I said, yeah. Well, they didn't know that I used to race fours back in the day. So I'm on this quad. I was, a, I got to be a bad guy and a good guy on this Netflix thing that they had coming out. Mm -hmm. So I got, to, cause it was like, you get to wear a mask and this and that. So you can't tell it was me, mm -hmm. but yeah, I had to ride that four wheeler. So I'm like power sliding around corners and bringing <laughs> and then sliding around and chasing these ATVs and these other like rhinos and stuff like that. And I think, dang, you know, fight choreography, f our fight scene that we have. Well, hopefully they'll let the show it here probably uh, in a few months. But uh, they said the fight scene I did was actually with another UFC fighter, uh, Steven Peterson, Ocho Peterson. But he was a LFA MMA fighter, and he's also a, U a UFC guy too. So we got to do it. And we're exactly about the same size. Mm -hmm. So we got to kind of play into realistic fighting, but realistic professional fighting 
Antoine, because I knew there's gonna always gonna be because we even watched like the guys that have been doing a little bit like you and me, like in like, jiu-jitsu is like, man, that's not real. That, that would never work. <laughs> yeah. That would never work. So I critique, I was like, God, that's freaking weak. I said, that's that's not how you hold a choke. <laughs> so we was got to be dialed in that way, like realistic fighting, but not too crazy way out there. So I'm not gonna do no Hollywood Jackie Chan Van Dam type of kicks. Mm-hmm. You know, you might see maybe something cool or two in there when you see it. But like I said, realistic jiu-jitsu, realistic striking from professional standards. But also it was te- technically sound too, so that's one cool thing about it, you know. And and with, I mean kill scenes. Um, there's one I'm hanging off the side of a, of a like one of the little rhino four wheelers where I'm hanging off the side, you know, and shooting shooting back at the bad guys on dirt dirt bikes and they're doing jumps in the air. I mean, so it's action packed, uh, suspenseful, cartels, drugs, women, viruses, the country boys take over. So I can't wait for that one to come out because that would be a great opportunity for this year for that something like that. Cause everybody li- wants to see something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they did come out with something here recently that, but they had Demi Moore in theirs, but it was almost the same kind of storyline ish. I think it fills it out pretty quick, but it was almost, uh, they didn't really have a good storyline. It's like, ah, it's just like the town shut down the cities. And it's like, a, it was almost like a story you've seen before kind of thing. And, uh, but the only thing with that, they had financial backing like crazy. Cause <clears throat> Demi Moore was like the main character in that one. Um, and, but like I said, you never heard no more about that one, but it was, I can't remember the name of that one. Um, like there again, I don't, I don't say much cause I don't remember the name of it. So ours, I think they're, they're still trying to figure out the name of ours. At first it was the wake up call. And the second one was golly, what a day. Um, so they're still kind of playing with the names of it right now, what they want to kind of call it. Mm-hmm. And it could change too. the direct or the, the people who's paying for it's like, now nah, don't use that name or the Netflix people like, now nah, let's get a better name than that. Cause they want it to, they want it to do really well too. They want more views and stuff like that also. Yeah. But like I said, the, so the, the writing thing that the, I hope that I'd be awesome. If I get that. I'm checking my email every day. Cause I put everything in, submitted my photos. Um, and then, um, let them know, hey, I can ride. I'm close to I'm close to Bartlesville, Pawhuska. I'll drive. Yeah, whatever. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm gonna see what that might lead into. Uh, but there again, me getting in there might create an opportunity to get another role, mm-hmm. another spot, or in or something else. So, but I'll never know if I don't try. So let's see what happens. You know, because you just gotta get in front of the right people. Yeah, you know, the right people see you. It's like, ooh, or maybe down the road. Maybe, uh, He'll be like in another film. Hey, I remember this guy. Mm-hmm. So you can have another opportunity for another movie, possibly as an extra or a sidekick or whatever. Um, so again, you know. It, but if I don't try, I'll never know. Yeah, and I definitely won't have regrets. So every opportunity now, I try to put something in, and um, you know, see what happens. You got to put yourself out there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Did you see the other one? I think it was posted yesterday. Um, they needed uh, drivers for like. To learn how to drive like a 1920s car. Oh, really? Yeah. From the same, from the same show? Or? Yeah, for the, I think, I believe it's for Killers of the Fire Moon. I must be. You like might want to check that one out too. Model, I bet. Yeah. Uh, I'll say, well, I can drive. I got a CDL. <laughs> I can drive 18 wheelers. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're, dang, I can't remember. I pr- I'm pretty sure it's like a, they're teaching you how to do it. And then you're going to be driving those cars throughout the movie, I believe. Ah, uh, okay. I can see that because I remember yeah. the, the movie in the book. I remember the natives were buying those old cars and oh, with their money and with their yeah. money and, and then buying a new one when it ran out of gas kind of thing. I heard, yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's, that's how I first heard of that. Yeah, because I was like, what really? So yeah, they didn't know no, they didn't know. Yeah, they'd leave their car and then buy another one. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot who told me that, and then I started reading that book, and then because I was like, for real, that was a that was a real thing, yeah, like real, yeah, it, drive it till it came out of gas and then just leave it. Yeah, leave because it they thought it wouldn't one. didn't do anything after that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fucking crazy. Yeah, and then, and because then, uh, a friend of mine, Mackie D's, uh, he's from New Mexico. He's he was heavily involved with Native community. He's a white guy, but it didn't matter. He was just around natives all the time. But mm-hmm. he was telling me about that. He knew that before I did. You know, because we was doing a job before roofing. I was working with a sheetrock company. We was doing a, we was doing like the, the Osage headquarters at the top of the hill. Um, they got a new development up there. Anyway, we, we delivered all the building materials for it at that time. And he was telling me the story about Osage Indians and this and that and how the FBI came about. So the FBI came about because of that issue. I didn't know anything about that. You mm-hmm. know, I was like, wow, really? Because, yeah, the FBI came because of that. 
that's how it started. They created FBI because of the native, you know, the the murders and the killings and started happening. Mm-hmm. So, Killers of Flower Moon. If you guys want to find an interesting read, it's realistic. It's actually what happened. You know, probably check that book out. Um, and then also that movie's coming out. So yeah, Leo and De Niro. De Niro, Leo, yeah. uh, Pacino, I believe. Yeah, uh, it's it's pretty much a full. That's cast. good enough. Yeah. That's Scorsese, I mean, yeah, I mean that director, yeah, yeah. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be great, I don't, I mean, because there's been a lot of films in Oklahoma too. Yeah, you it's know? it's booming. I was just yeah. talking about that with somebody else. Like, and so it, much work coming there. Yeah, because that's what a buddy, my Jake, was saying. It's like there's gonna be so much stuff gonna be happening. More, I mean, there's stuff coming, coming, and coming always. I guess because the market is better here for tax reasons, yeah. or something like that. And uh, so a lot, lot more opportunity for people like us, you know, mm-hmm. and me that's trying to get into it. But once we kind of get going, then it's going to, yeah. Because I don't know anything about agencies and ta- casting agencies or anything like that. I think he's with TAB. I think TAB agency. But like mm-hmm. I said, I don't I have anything. He goes, I'm just kind of winging it right now. Yeah. You know, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, maybe later on, like, <clears throat> you know, you come back on and I could have, like, some actors that are, you know, have agencies. And yeah, help me out. Y'all could swap, like. You know, ideas and shit, you know. Let me out starting hard, Joe. <laughs> Shout out. I, but I did reach out to him on, um, on, see where it might have been Instagram. I sent him a message mm-hmm. because I knew he needed films and all that. And, uh, um, I said, hey, because I told him, I told my guy about Netflix, that Netflix series, because funding's going to come at, hey, we're going to have to get funding for this if, if we get approved. And mm-hmm. so I was like, man, I wonder if I can get the tribe that, to help out because they'll have one of their native Muscogee Creek nation guy be one of the main roles in it. But I starting about it. He goes, you have any tribal funding for many of your stuff? He goes, nah, I said they won't unless it's trying to either showcase something of theirs or their, their tribe or something like that. It'd be tough to get that involved, but you know, I guess it wouldn't hurt to ask, you know, yeah. it's find the right people. Cause maybe they might, you know, but it's got, yeah, I definitely get it, you know, but, you know, worst they could say is no. Yeah, yeah. I don't ask. I guess I'll never know. So, yeah. But I thought that avenue, but it was cool that I sent him a message and like, you know, I always heard that he was like, you know, Reservoir Dogs and all that. Yeah, that's the name of it, right? Yeah, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. So Reservation Dogs. Reservation. My dogs. bad. Yeah. <laughs> there's a movie. Is it Reservoir Dog? I think there's, I think there's a, a movie like that too. But that's a Tarantino. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, because I because I remember I was going to do do something with him, but it was all they're looking for teenagers and kids and young ones. I was like, oh man, dang it, no, because I, I can't do that one. But he, I'm sure he's got stuff coming on often every now and then. So I'm trying to stay on his radar too, because mm-hmm. maybe he might need a a guy like me with my my, my specific skill sets. Do you think you'll uh, do acting classes? Uh, I'm I'm definitely open to it. It's just time wise. Oh know, yeah, yeah. It's just, just trying to. Like say for well for reason that's since they said the writers I've already got private lessons set up for for learning how to ride better. Oh yeah, you know? it's good because I just because like even that western that we shot that's gonna be filming Friday. Mm-hmm. If you come in with knowing how to ride, I get I, I bump you up the list of more things that you can do. Yeah. you know, um, so I want to kind of have that in my system because more than like if I do play a Native American role or or even in the back extra, more than likely it's going to be a time period maybe where Indians are riding horses. Okay, so I got to learn how to ride, you know, just in case. Or I might be in a cowboy movie where I'll be like the like uh, Chavez, Chavez, like in Young Guns too, the, mm-hmm. the, the Mexican Indian guy, you know. Yeah. So it could be something like that, you know. So I got. I want to make sure I can put that on my resume. Is like, hey, I can horseback ride. I can drive this. I can do this. I can fight. I mean, because there again, the more things you can do, the more opportunities you're gonna have to do something. Yeah. You know, if you just if you can't do this and this and this, well, that eliminates you real quick. So, I think that's probably really about it. That I. I, I mean, everything else. I can. Like I said, I can ride. I can. I can ride, drive everything. Um, no airplanes or helicopters. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Well, we can CG all that stuff, man. I can, I can act like I'm flying a plane. Green um, screen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I played those games when I was little. I know how to do that good. I can, like I'm flying plane. Uh, but yeah, so I, I but horses, I, I want definitely want, I want to learn because I think that could definitely add another great thing to my, to whatever I, all the can, I can do already. Because mm-hmm. not everybody can ride, you know. No, yeah. And and, but, so, but if you can add that on your thing, that's a great extra thing to have. You know, so 
I need to learn how to ride a horse, man. I'm like super scared though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get th- uh, thrown off. Well, I'll let you know how mine goes. And I can send you, and you come over, we can, we can ride together. Yeah. You have to teach me, bro. <laughs> oh, I get to beat on front. <laughs> hold on to you. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> hold on, Russ. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm excited, man. I'm excited for. Uh, this acting journey that you're gonna get on, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep going and, and see what happens. Like I said, I just want to keep going, keep going, and and, mm-hmm. and hopefully keep things keep ha- opportunities keep happening where you know, kind of like it is that like we talked about. Like Oklahoma is, is starting to get booming with m- movie industry and creating films and all that. And um, I like that. I like making little videos, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I don't like on my social media pages, I like I like making little videos on my iPhone, you know, and doing stuff that nobody else is doing with the iPhone, and and uh, so I like playing, being the editing guy, and having fun with editing and all that, and mm-hmm. um, just picking up stuff as I go, you know. Also from being in films or commercials or TV, you pick up little things how to make things look a little bit better, framing things out just right, and. So it, it, it helps me in my work life too, you know, cause I'm, I, I do better drone work, you know, transitioning scenes and stuff like that. You kind of see what is good and lighting. And so it, it helps me in my pro- pro- professional career in the roofing world because I do roof inspections. I do videos with my social media with roofing drone work videos. And I got a buddy of mine that helps me do it as well. Greg. He helps me do the drone work too, and I help we kind of collaborate on editing and making things look better and crisper, you know, better uh, graphics or whatever like that too on the side too. So mm-hmm. um, that's just something else that I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then also, like, when did uh, when did you start roofing with Thomas? I started roofing with Thomas a hundred percent. I started roofing with Thomas probably. Uh, probably about six months ago. Six months ago. About six months. Ago. But I've been in roofing about four years yeah. with other companies. Um, I remember seeing that, like you were you were with uh, roofing companies, but I didn't know if like um, you were under anybody or if right. you started. Jump. But when yeah. I seen roofing with Thomas, I was like, okay, that must be his own yeah. business now. Yeah. You know? So so even when I was with the other companies, I kind of branded myself away a little bit, but still working their company. But branded out. So I was slowly kind of transitioning my way out at a slow pace kind of thing where working for that company powered by roofing with Thomas kind of thing to where, mm. and then slowly that made the transition to me only. Cause now everybody thinks that everybody thought it was me anyway at the beginning. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh, it must be Thomas. It must be Thomas's thing. And, uh, so at that time I was making everybody else ridiculous money in the roofing world. I was like, man, I can do this. You know, I just gotta get all the money things like I'm supposed to my documentation and paperwork and licensing and insurance stuff. And then, cause like 99% was all my jobs that I created, you know, but like say, let's say if you were my licensed guy, I just put, you know, 200, 200 grand in your pocket and you did nothing, you know, yeah. you know? So I was like, why can't I do that myself? You know? So this last six months, I've a hundred percent committed to me and my business and we're training the salesman right now. And, and, so I just, even though last year sucked for the world, it was my biggest year financially because oh, really? of hustle and grind yeah. and also just putting myself out there, um, and then social media working out better and just doing a great job with people, you know, cause when COVID happened, three hell storms happened at that exact same time. We're actually like this weekend, hell storm, the weekend after hell storm, we can have a hell storm. So it helped in the, in the insurance world and the roofing world was great for us because of insurance was paying, you know, and, and even though people was kind of out of money, and out of jobs for your insurance checks and your roof and your leak, well, you, you gave us the business, you know, but you gave us the business because of reputation and and how you treat customers and homeowners and that's the reason why i got a lot of work that way because man dude i'm a guy that you know i do what i say say what i do you know and i take care of them you know Mm -hmm. so worked out great yeah wow yeah damn it's fucking awesome man yeah, so I'm crushing the game, killing the roof. He world is and, and, uh, crushing everything, everything, <laughs> crushing it all. <laughs> <laughs> should buy some tacos, man. I was oh, eating tacos. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> we should have done this yesterday. I would have brought tacos up here, but it was yesterday. <laughs> so check out my roof, my roofing page, Roofing with Thomas, and you can see Taco Tuesdays on there. And then there's some good ones, some funny ones. Uh, but I do it every Tuesday, Taco Tuesday. <laughs> 
Taco Tuesday tips. Ruth chats with Taco. <laughs> Check us out. YouTube channel coming soon. <laughs> Can't wait for that. <laughs> Tacos every day. <laughs> oh man, I was gonna tell you, man. Uh, are you following um, the Cherokee Nation Film Office? I seen a little thing they're gonna put out like here in a month or so. A short, we, short film. A short film thing. I seen the film. I was like, damn, I can't do nothing like that. Cause there were some some clean ones, some like some. I said that can't be no iPhone. Like some of them videos, like that ain't no iPhone. That's some <laughs> that's some like ten thousand dollar camera y'all shot that on. I, was uh, like, I ain't got no, my iPhone don't do that. I don't know how y'all did that. You gotta watch mine. I did mine on my iPhone. You should. Uh, Which was what's the name of yours? It's called Smudge. Smudge, okay. I'm yeah. gonna check that out. You're yeah, I'll, I'll probably home. show you after we're done. But uh, yeah. uh, yeah, I called my buddy up like the night of it was due. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do it right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, it went pretty good. But we didn't win. But um, man, I was gonna say like, uh, if I think of an idea, maybe we should all do something. Yeah, oh, I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. I'm gonna like, well, learn something. Yeah, yeah so we can do something together. I was sitting there and learn something, and I'll be able to, yeah utilize for something later in the future. Shoot, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Sweet with tacos. You heard it here, everyone. He's gonna bring tacos and tacos. That's only why I'm doing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, uh, I guess, um, uh, I guess we'll cut it because I know there's more to talk about. Right. And bro, you're welcome back anytime. Sweet. Cool. Anytime to come back on. You know, if you want to have new stuff coming up, come on and for sure, man. We'll get the word out there and talk about it and like, um. Bring Keelan. Yes. Bring uh, anybody you want, man. Okay. We'll fucking just get on here and just have a good time, man. Yeah. And get to know, get to know them and everything. So, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, just hit me up and let me know, because um, I want to save a lot for the next time you come on. Yeah, that's yeah. what I like to do, man. Like okay. uh, people will talk, and then I'm like, I'm like, let's not give everybody part two. Yeah, coming next yeah. time. <laughs> Shut up. No more. That's enough. And um, but uh. If you want to uh, tell the listeners about uh, how to maybe follow you on social media, uh, shout out like uh, Roofing with Thomas, yep. Thunder Kick Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, Thunder Kick Jiu Jitsu and MMA. Check us out on Facebook uh, and also Instagram, I believe. Uh, I think we even have a TikTok. I think it's called the Thunder Kick. Maybe, really? Possibly. Check us out. Um, it's kind of newly, but it's it's on there. We up there. We up there. And then. Um, uh, I'm not a Twitter guy. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not really an Instagram guy, but I gotta get better at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, roofing with Thomas. Make roofing ke- make roofing cool again dot com. Take them some apparel, America. Ooh. Yeah, so check it out. Make roofing cool again dot com. Check get some get some t shirts and hats. Um, trying to come out with a new brand for roof for the roofing world, but also for the Patriots as well. Uh, so we're kind of slowly starting to get that out there and yeah check me out on facebook just thomas longacre um and don't forget taco tuesdays every tuesday <laughs> yeah 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 and then, um, you got some uh youtube videos like past fights or anything yeah i mean you can check this this we probably type in this uh probably thomas thunder kick longacre and you'll probably see some old fights of mine um i said i got over i think 54 professional fights and there's only been like six or seven on YouTube, um, so there's some good ones. Some little hype, little hype videos of me and Comanche Boy fight, MMA fights, World Combat League fights. I don't think there's any kickboxing on the thing, but yeah, you can see some stuff more about me too. And jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, some jujitsu matches. There should be some jujitsu matches on there too. Show enough. Show enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you ever watch the Hodge twins? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man well, this has been a blast bro like thank you for coming thank yeah. you for making time and you know coming on and um yes sir i we'll enjoyed i enjoyed this man like oh, sweet. Cool. you know because we met like a while ago but never have the time to sit down and hear everything about you mm. you know right so man that was like it's awesome dude it's uh-huh. awesome to you know have this conversation and um that's why i love doing this man bringing people on and just getting lost in their stories and just hearing everything, man. It's awesome, dude. It's awesome. And, you know, I hope the listeners, like, I hope they love it too, man, because I find this stuff interesting. You know, I want to find people that are doing, like, 
really cool things with their lives and following mm. like passions that they want to do. Right. You know, they're just not being like working at nine to five, working for the man or whatever, you know, they're out doing these things and they're starting things, you know, and then they're like you, like giving out like uh, everything you've been through and everything you've gone through. And maybe somebody can be like, Oh, I want to try MMA, you know, now you don't have to be afraid or yeah. I want to start a business, you know, or something, you know, so that's, a, that's kind of where this thing's going, man. It's just like, inspiration and you know having the motivation and do not be afraid to fail <laughs> right so yeah yeah i yeah. feel a lot i mm-hmm. feel a lot and most, and most people do it was a lot the tough thing is people fail and they quit and they don't go go again but but it, it's only you only fail when you don't get back up mm-hmm. so and that's don't be... either business life or whatever mm-hmm. don't quit you gotta keep pushing that's what we do it's what warriors do yeah you either a or b for no, real bro. yeah and don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. you know never be afraid of that exactly um if you're not following Oki podcast on instagram please go follow it uh, i also have a facebook page Oki podcast on facebook uh if you want to add me russell sun eagle go ahead my personal is uh rustamus 49 on instagram if you want to follow that um Okie Podcast is available on all platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Audible, Amazon Music, YouTube. Um, I'm not a Twitter guy either, but there is a Twitter page, but I don't get on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get into Twitter. I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's going to be all for me and Thunderkick. Yeah. This guy is fucking amazing. I hope you all love this episode. And uh, once again, man, thanks for coming on. So until next time, everybody, peace.